This is Dan and Lexi from Dan Schultz Outdoors, reminding you, keep the adventures alive. Hey y'all, I'm Johnny. And I'm Colleen. And, and we're, we're the Kiel Quest. Quest. And, and we, we want, want you to, to keep, keep the, the adventures, adventures alive. alive. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, this is Darren from My Paddle Repeat, encouraging you to keep the adventures alive. This is David from Beachley Ironworks saying keep the adventures alive. Hi, I'm Kevin Collin, the Happy Camper. Remember, keep the adventures alive. Awesome! Woo, buddy! Shug here! Keep the adventures alive. I am. Ethan here, the Avid Outdoorsy Guy, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. We're John and Aaron. Keep the adventures alive. Hey everyone, it's Kylan from Lure of the North, and I encourage you to keep the adventures alive. This is Sky North telling you, keep the adventures alive. And now on with the show. Disclaimer. This episode has been produced to bring awareness to everyone of the dangers of wild animal encounters in the backcountry. Wild animals, big or small, are very unpredictable and should never be fed or approached. Canoe Hound Adventures, Canoe Hound's Outdoor Adventure Show, and all persons in this episode assume no responsibility or liability for the information shared in this show. All tips, advice, suggestions, and stories shared in this episode are the opinion of the individuals within the show. Please do your own research and practice safe camping techniques to avoid unnecessary encounters. Maintain a clean campsite for your safety and for future visitors. Leave no trash and leave no trace. Now on with the show. Hey, well, happy Tuesday evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show, a show that brings you a lot closer to the great outdoors by bringing you hot topics and the uh, YouTube content creators that you guys and gals all enjoy and watch. My name is Dennis, uh, also known as Canoe Hound, and if this is your first time tuning into the show, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please do hit that subscribe button because we have many great shows coming your way and uh, things are looking up for the future for us. That's for sure. Uh, we are live here every Tuesday evening at 7 PM Eastern standard time. And uh, if you're watching this as a replay, I hope you could join us sometime live. Uh, it's a very interactive show. And if you join live, uh, you have the ability to uh, partake in a lot of different things, a lot of activities in here in the chat and stuff like that. So uh, please do pick us up sometime and watch us live. Uh, let's see here. Before we get into tonight's show, which, uh, as you could tell, or I'm sure you've seen the thumbnail, is a show that uh, I've been asked to produce for uh, quite a while. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to bring it to you. But I had to throw that disclaimer in because there are 
a lot of different opinions when it comes to dealing with wild animals in the backcountry, especially when it comes to bears. And uh, we try to, we're going to try and cover a lot, but the best thing you could do is uh, ask a lot of questions, learn a lot yourself, and uh, use your common sense out there. That's for sure. Uh, I'd like to start with a bit of channel news before we do get into our guests tonight. Uh, let's see here. We've got uh, tonight. It's marking a milestone for us. This is actually the first episode that we're uh, we're running tonight that is actually live streaming here on YouTube and on Facebook as well. So if you're watching over on Facebook, thanks very much for uh, for tuning in on Facebook, and uh, feel free to jump over to the uh, Canoe Hound Adventures over on YouTube and watch them live there. It doesn't matter as long as you're watching and you're learning. That's always a good thing. Uh, last week's show, we were joined by Preston Sear from uh, the 2021 Paddle in the Park contest, and we had a lot of discussions about that. We had some past winners and past volunteers from the show, and uh, we shared a lot of stories. It was actually quite a fun show, and uh, they're glad to be bringing it back this year. Last year, they missed due to this whole COVID thing, but uh, this year... They're going to be back in full force, and uh, the wheels have started turning already on that. So if you missed last week's show, feel free to jump back into one of our playlists on uh, Canoe Hound Adventures Season 2 of the show here, and uh, you'll find last week's show. You can watch it whenever you want. You can watch bits and pieces, whatever, but uh, feel free to tune in there and check it out as well. Uh, last week, uh, congratulations to last week's swag giveaway winner, who was uh, Chris MacGyver. He won a Canoe Hound Adventures prize pack along with some goodies from Algonquin Outfitters and some really good swag that Preston uh, Sear had actually given as well for or so, some stuff that he had from Paddle in the Park last time and uh, some great prizes. So uh, I've been in touch with Chris. Congratulations. And uh, your prizes are in the mail. So that's an awesome thing there. Uh, once again, I wanted to throw a huge shout out to... Uh, some of our membership supporters, uh, those that support the channel uh, through our memberships. Uh, Donald Kelly is a new member. Uh, we have our solo paddler members, Stein North, Kevin with an A, and uh, Jeremy Wallace. Thanks very much for your ongoing support. If anybody is interested in becoming a Canoe Hound Adventures member, uh, up above the chat there, I put a, uh, a link there, or you can click on the link below that says join. And uh, all new members will get their Canoe Hound Adventures bottle decal, their channel member sticker. Uh, that'll come in the mail uh, soon after becoming a channel member. And uh, just something that we're, uh, we're launching at the end of March for all channel members that are still members at the end of March, uh, we will be doing a uh, Canoe Hound Adventures swag giveaway. We've got uh, some great prizes that we'll be throwing your way. Uh, to one lucky winner. So uh, you'll want to make sure that if you want to be a part of that, then you can uh, jump on and become a channel member. Uh, all the information is down below. You can check that out at any time. Uh, I also like to thank some of the uh, businesses that help support uh, Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. I always start off with my sip of coffee from the Backcountry Coffee Company. Thanks very much, Kyle. Always good stuff. And it's always really hot out of a tin cup. Always really hot. Good thing I poured it like 20 minutes ago, it's cooled down a bit. But uh, yeah, so we got the Backcountry Coffee Company, uh, our good friends over at Kid Products, makers of the Kid Twig Stove, as well as a Reflector Oven. Uh, great signs and graphics. They take care of all our cool swag. Uh, the Short Hills Beard Company and Algonquin Outfitters. So thanks very much for your support to all them companies. Uh, something that I've been uh, bringing across to many people of late are... are Patches that we ha we have for sale right now. We have uh, Canoe Hound Adventures and Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventures Show. These are iron-on patches. Uh, they go great on backpacks, uh, jackets, coats, shirts, uh, hats, whatever you want to put them onto. Uh, they are six dollars each, or two for ten. And if you buy the two for ten, I'll also throw in a Canoe Hound Adventures decal pack and free shipping. So for ten dollars, you're getting three items. Helps support the channel, and. Uh, Hey, going to make your stuff look good, I guess, right? That's what I say anyways. Um, and once again, if anybody has any hot topics that they would like to uh, maybe get across to me, and I'm just looking for my link here, you can uh, send any uh, show ideas or, or uh, guests that you'd like to see on the show. Send it over to canoehound at gmail.com. I'll do my best to uh, to make it happen. And back to the patches, if you're interested in something like that, just drop me an email there as well. And once again, as you know, this show is an interactive show. Uh, 
I would say that if you have any questions, put them in the chat over here on the left hand side, and or no, your right hand side, and uh, we'll uh, we'll try and get them up. But put the word question in capital letters beforehand. But even for tonight's show, I would prefer it if you could please try to hold off on your questions until about half hour into the show, because we have a lot to cover, and we kind of have a, have an itinerary here that we're going to try and get things in so we can try and get all the information out tonight that uh, that we really wanted to. But uh, at any time, put your questions in. And after 8 o'clock, after we do our swag giveaway, we will also be opening up the panel to anybody that wants to come up and ask a question, tell a quick story, uh, or share some information with, uh, with everybody else watching tonight. So without further ado, let's get into tonight's show because this is a topic that, uh, like I say, we've been wanting to bring you for quite a while. Uh, we'll be talking about bears in the backcountry and how to better uh, bear-proof your camp uh, for safety's sake, of course. A uh, couple of our guests that we have on tonight are kind of regulars to the show. They've been on other times for other topics, including cameo appearances. And uh, they they kind of know their stuff. Uh, we're going to share a few stories that are good stories, but kind of scary in the same right. and just goes to show that it can happen to anybody out there. Uh, First on panel that we'll be bringing up here is uh, from the YouTube channel, Kevin Outdoors. I'd like to welcome to the live stream tonight, Kevin Wright. How are you doing, Kevin? Hello. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm hey. good. I brought a couple bears with me. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, you do too, eh? Yeah, they're just hanging around there. One's yeah. got your paddle. You might want to get that back, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to uh, work on that. Yeah. Nice to see you, Dennis. Thank you. Good to see you again. too. Thanks for uh, for joining us tonight. I just want to let everybody in the chat know that uh, if there seems to be a little a bit of lag with Kevin, um, he's running from uh, would you say satellite uh, internet? So there's a bit of a delay between the two of us here. So I've got a yeah, I've got a satellite connection. Yep. Yeah, I've got cool. a satellite connection. There's often a delay, and and uh, often that results in over talking. And I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to be rude, but uh, um, I'll try and behave. I'll, I'll leave a little pause whenever I can to, to let you finish. Uh, next up on panel uh, is one of my favorite YouTube uh, content creators and someone who recently posted a video about a scary bear encounter with uh, her, her wife, and their little guy. Uh, it was a, a video that scared the pants off me. I'd like to welcome to the stream Chris, Julia, and Cedar. Hi, Cedar. Oh, yeah, that's you. <laughs> Hi everybody. How y'all doing tonight? We're well. How are you guys? Oh, this is gonna I'm I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, like given the circumstances in the world today, I'm doing quite well. So this is good stuff. Cedar well, also got his bear. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you see the big scary bear? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, you know what? I, I thought I thought it would be fitting that um we would actually start with uh, a little bit of the story or the encounter that uh, Chris and Julia and Cedar had encountered this past summer uh, in Algonquin Park. Uh, it was a video that I've I've watched three times. This video, all like all in all, and each wow. time I watched this video, I I was I was terrified for you guys. I was I was like actually frightened and like almost biting my nails, frightened. Right. <laughs> What, what did you what did you experience out there uh, for those that may not have seen the video give them a nutshell the nutshell version yeah um so we um <laughs> yeah, is just gonna make a, a a short appearance tonight and he's gonna go to bed soon um, so we decided uh to take cedar out um, for his very first backcountry camping trip when he was about eight months old. And this was really important to us to, um, you know, so that he would never have a time that he didn't remember camping. And uh, the... <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little distracted right now. <laughs> the joys of children. Many, many of us have uh, had children, and we anyways, understand. For, long story short, uh, we had a bear encounter. Uh, we all came out safe and sound, which is really good. Um, but the bear did manage to uh, eat all of our food. Um, yeah. I must say, Chris is an amazing storyteller. I was more fearful watching the video than I was at the time <laughs> that the bear encounter occurred. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, the, the story did come across very well, and the, the way you narrated it, Chris, was uh, 
was, was awesome. Yeah, like, the, the pacing... Julia, you were a brave gal to get out there, and the way you were confronting I, what they say the 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 mother bear and the cub don't get between them. Well, yeah, say the same opposite, right? Like you're yeah, out there exactly. standing around. Yeah, I I just had in my head that like everything that I've been taught for outdoor education over the years is just that black bears you have to be big and loud and um and scare them off so I just had in my head and I had recently been watching that show Working Moms and I remember in the first episode this like woman has a bear encounter and she just like Ah, screams. So I did my best impression of that. I thought at the time that I sounded really scary. And then when I watched the video, I realized that I sounded pretty scared. Um, but um, it, uh, to my surprise, the bear was not as scared of me as I thought it would be. And thank God we had bear spray. Yeah. And he, he was a big old brute, wasn't he? Like he was a big male bear. Like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I've seen plenty of bears in the backcountry, and that there, like from what I've seen on the video, was probably one of the biggest bears I've ever seen. He was big and around, eh? Yeah, and quite aggressive as well. Yeah, yeah, and he, he knew what he wanted. Yeah, something that we learned uh, that we weren't aware of at the time was the the huffing and the chopping that the bear did was a sign of aggression. Um, and at the time, we didn't know that. We, we did have some bear safety knowledge with us, but we didn't know that specific detail. Uh, and so at the time, um, it, it was a bit of a triangle between the bear, the tent, and the food. Uh, and the bear was never approaching the tent. The bear was always approaching the food. Yeah, it was very clear that that's what he wanted. Yeah. And Julia, Julia effectively put herself between the bear and the food, um, which is pretty, pretty uh, brave. Yeah, in <laughs> um, hindsight, right? Yeah. And um, the bear eventually got within about two meters of Julia, and Julia gave the, the bear a light spritz of the, the bear spray. Um, and that was actually enough to send it back into the forest. And I think... I think, you know, we, I, I think I'm going to put this guy to bed. I'm yeah. sure that the <laughs> He sounds like he's having a whoop roar yeah. time over there. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for everybody's patience with the... <laughs> oh, okay, can you wait by? Cedar, do you, you want to say bye? Bye, 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 bye Cedar. Cedar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> bye, Cedar. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for everybody's patience. Uh, so um, yeah, effectively what happened was, oh, Cedar's going upstairs. Um, the bear, the bear finally came within two meters of Julia. We gave the bear a light tap of the bear spray. Well, Julia did, uh, and that was actually enough to send the bear back into the forest. And in hindsight, I sort of wish we had given the bear uh, more of a full blast of the bear spray because it probably would have had a more lasting effect on the bear. Um, but you know, we like we've been camping in the park for uh, like me for a decade and Julia for almost two decades now. And you hardly ever see bears in the back country and they usually go the other way. Um, and at the time we sort of felt like, you know, if a light mist of bear spray was enough to send it back into the forest, then two full cans of it certainly would. Um, and at the time, uh, it was also getting a lot darker uh, than the, the video leads on uh, because the camera was filming in aperture priority mode. Uh, the ISO was set to auto, so it was exposing for Julia's face and making the sky look blown out. Uh, and effectively, it didn't, it effectively made it appear as though it was earlier in the day when in reality it was actually getting quite dark quite fast. Uh, and the other thing that played into our, our consideration to stay there was. Um, we didn't have much paddling experience at nighttime either, so we ultimately made the decision to stay uh, just because it would have been really challenging to, to pack up really quickly and paddle out before the dark. Uh, and in hindsight, it's really easy to say now that you know we we should have we should have left, uh, but we more or less made the decision that we did at the time with the best information that we had available to us, uh, which I I will admit was incomplete. Um, but yeah, 
Uh, when did you first notice that the bear was around? Because um, the first I, the first scene I remember of the video uh, with the bear encounter was actually Julie outside, like doing that with the bear, right? Yeah. So we we got to the campsite. Uh, we got there. If I I I can't remember exactly when we got there, but I think we got there around like three or four. Um, we set up camp. We had a nap in the tent for like an hour and a half to two hours. We kind of milled around for a little bit. Uh, we finally decided to make dinner. Uh, and it wasn't until Julia popped the lid off the food barrel. Uh, and that was one of the first times that the lid came off the food barrel. It, it wasn't until about two or three minutes later uh, that the bear came into camp. Um, so we were, we were actually there at the campsite for a fair amount of time before the bear actually came into camp. Mm -hmm. And who's who seen it first, you or Julia? Oh, Julia did. So I was in the tent at the time. Uh, I was with Cedar. Uh, and Julia was, she just popped off the lid. She was thinking, you know what, it's time to get dinner going. I'm going to open up the barrel, pull out the, the camp stove and start cooking. Uh, and then all of a sudden I just heard this screaming. Um, and to add to the story, and this was part of my report to Algonquin Parks afterwards, but I didn't actually include it in the video was um, right around the same time, we were actually hearing bear, well, not bear horns, but we were hearing air horns blasting on the other side of, of Joe Lake or Little Joe. And so we were not the only ones having a bear encounter on that lake at that particular time. There were people having on the opposite side of the lake somewhere also having a bear encounter of their own. Uh, and that also played into and factored into our decision. I know some other people said that we should have packed up and gone to a neighboring campsite, uh, but we sort of, we, we didn't know where the other bear experience was happening. <laughs> and so, it, you know, just like, it's, yeah, it made for a, a really tough decision, really tough decision. Yeah, but the, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I can tell everybody here uh, with 100% certainty that YouTube did not play into our decision whatsoever. And I, I can I can honestly say if the encounter had happened about a half an hour to an hour earlier, and we had just a little bit more light, we probably would have paddled out. But at the time when it happened, it felt like we were losing light really quickly. Um, and it, I mean, it was a really challenging decision, but considering what had happened and just the light puffs up the bear back into the forest. Um, we sort of felt like the bear knew that we meant business. Uh, and yeah, we made the, the decision that we did uh, in, incomplete as it was not knowing about uh, bears chomping and, and that's how they show aggress aggression. But um, Julia did put herself between the bear and the food barrel uh, and the bear was always going food for the food barrel and not the tent. So, yeah, he, you could tell he was on a mission, basically, right? He he automatically assumed that the blue barrel meant food, right? Yeah, uh, that's the yeah. problem with uh, bears in, in 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 provincial parks, or for the most part, when they become acclimated to to humans, you know, and they know that that blue barrel is a food source for them because they they've gotten into one, and now all of a sudden they know that's. It's, yeah. it's like going to Marine Land, the old bears that they used to have, they used to pull up a tin can full of peanuts and and, and popcorn, right? Yeah. I'm showing my age now, but <laughs> <laughs> so that that's probably what it was. So you got you you, you were probably never really, really, really in danger. And I, I, I say that loosely, okay, because I know there's always a threat and danger there. But he wanted your food. That's all he wanted. Right. He wanted more food. Yeah, the bear. Yeah. The bear was always after our food. He never made an approach for the tent uh, or Cedar and I. He he was just going straight for for the barrel. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, the one the one thing I got a kick out of, and this is just taking a, a little a little bit of uh, humor out of out of the situation that I seen was when Julia was waving her arms and saying, "You're a beautiful animal." <laughs> <laughs> But go away, I'm big, right? so, yeah. And funny, funny side story. Julia started out by uh, banging a canoe paddle, uh, but we we realized that that wasn't uh, making enough noise. Yeah. Uh, so uh, she quickly switched over to uh, a pan that made a lot more noise, uh, and that that pan was newly purchased. Uh, I kid you not, the day before. 
uh, brand new pan, and you should see the pan afterwards. It was just smashed to pieces, well, not to pieces, but all dented up. <laughs> so okay. Julia, Julia definitely gave it her all. Small, small price. So, hey, what, what, what do you think you could have done differently in, in the situation that you're in? Um, I, I do wish we had given the bear a full blast of bear spray. I wish we had, you know, given it like if, and I'm sure we're going to get to, to Kevin's content very soon, but, uh, Kevin has, has some incredible videos on bear safety and bear awareness that I would encourage everyone here to go and watch, uh, because Kevin is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to bears. Um, I, I wish we had given it a full second or two, a full on blast from the bear spray, um, which is something that you see Kevin demonstrate in uh, one of his videos on how to use bear spray. Because I think I think that might have put the bear on its heels a little bit more and kept it from coming back. Um, we at the time we didn't think it would come back, and knowing what we know now. Uh, in hindsight, it's it's really easy to armchair quarterback it and say, you know, we definitely should have left it, should have left the site and braved, and braved uh, paddling in the dark. Uh, but at the time, we had very little uh, paddling experience in the dark. We felt very comfortable and confident paddling in the daylight with cedar because we had experienced that many many times. But we just we had zero experience paddling in the dark with cedar. Um, and we feel much differently about it now. Uh, after the Minas Link earlier this summer, we have a ton of paddling experience in the dark. Uh, we feel much more confident paddling in the dark now. Um, so I would not, given our experience uh, and knowledge of paddling in the dark, I, I now I would probably leave in the dark. Mm -hmm. so, so now you, you, Julia, and you scared away the bear the first time. And then he proceeded to come back in the evening and he got into your food barrel. You said he come back three times? Like he was at, in the camp three times? Uh, a total of three times, yeah. So he came yeah. back. Um, I, um, the details. Uh, so he came back uh, shortly after we got the barrel up. Um, and then he came back for a third time in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, crazy. Yeah. He, he, he wanted it. I just he like to say it. that. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say I, I don't think you can uh, second guess. You know, you were there. Only you know what you could have done then. And you only, you know, um, there's lots of armchair quarterbacks. I've had lots of comments about my videos about you sh people should do this and that. And people get very, very, um, I don't know, they develop their idea of what it was like. And only you know what it was like because you were there. Um, I had a similar uh, encounter. I told the story in my first time uh, on Dennis's show where – just like that, it was getting dark and we had some people that uh, uh, my mother-in-law was with us and she had a, a bad shoulder and, and like, well, we could jump in the boats and go away, but where do we go? Can can she paddle? You got to make a decision and and live with it. So um, you did just fine. Uh, people people ask me, what, what should I do better? I said, well, you're alive, right? So you did it right. Uh, and you probably learned something along the way. Yeah, that, I think that's, yeah. Th thank you for saying that, Kevin. Um, and we, we had reservations about whether or not we should share the video. Um, I had mixed feelings about sharing it. Uh, but I think what we ultimately felt was it was a cautionary tale that hopefully other people could learn from. Um, and something that I came across and I've come to recognize is that you can have a lot of experience in the backcountry, but not be very experienced with bears. Um, and yeah. I can't tell you how many people thanked me afterwards and said, I've been camping in the park for 20, 30, 40 years. I've never had a bear encounter like that. I didn't take bears very seriously, but I will now. I will I will take bear spray with me. Um, and I, I think it also really hits home the importance of leave no trace. Um, that, that should have been a bigger warning sign to me when I first pulled up at the campsite and saw trash, new trash, new food waste trash in the fire pit. Um, it should have been a bigger warning sign to me. And I, I think it, it, it is a cautionary tale that hopefully hopefully makes everybody take Leap No Trace a little bit more seriously because you never know who's going to be coming to camp at that campsite after you and what kind of wildlife you're going to attract to the campsite because of it. So, so important to leave no trace. Mm -hmm. um, and 
after we cleaned up the site, we, we did a very thorough exhaustive cleanup of not only our, uh, our food barrel that had been torn apart, but we also went around the campsite and cleaned up everything that was floating around the campsite as well, uh, which, which was not great. It was, uh, those, those campsites were unfortunately quite, quite littered. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just so everybody in the chat knows, uh, Brian J, one of my moderators has uh, posted the link to uh, Chris and Julia's video. Uh, give that a watch. Uh, if you haven't already watched it, give it a watch after the show, of course, but uh, yeah. give you something to watch after the, after the fact. But I would say what is ultimately more important is to watch Kevin's videos <laughs> because uh, we are by no means bear experts. Uh, we have some bear knowledge, but we, our breadth of knowledge is not nearly as deep or as thorough as Kevin's. Kevin, Kevin, my hat is off to you because uh, you've done an incredible job with your videos and the bear safety elements that you've got in them. So I would encourage everybody to go check out Kevin's videos. Um, there's bear behavior videos, bear spray videos, hanging food uh, videos, the, the wealth of knowledge there is, is very extensive. Uh, and I, what I really appreciate, appreciate about your videos, Kevin, is that you also introduce a lot of research into it as well. It's backed with a lot of research, which I think is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. We, we yeah, will thanks, get Chris. into you know, all yeah. the safety stuff or the stuff that, that advice and tips. Uh, and we're gonna be really picking your brain here, Kevin. But I just wanted to show Chris, uh, I, I downloaded a couple of pictures that I had found on the internet a long, long time ago. And uh, the amazing thing was, is the bear actually got their food while it was still hanging, popped the top off their barrel and got all their food. And Chris was actually wondering how that happens, right? Well, I found these pictures. One, here's our black bear friend, climb the, uh, climb the tree. And there's the line with the bird feeder over there. And before you know it, he's an acrobat. Oh, my goodness. And then before you know it, he's popping oh the top off goodness. your food barrel. Oh, my goodness. You figured it out. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, I've seen these these pictures a long time ago. And they, they've, they've stuck with me just because oh. of, of the great debate. You know, do you hang food or do you, do you not hang food? And if the bear wants it, there's a good chance he's going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I just thought I would share that with you, Chris, because like I say, that, that'll give you a little, you know, how did like, he, he's not a magician. He's an acrobat. Right? Yeah. I was scratching my head. Like I, I, like in the, I say in the video, I've been laying awake at night thinking about how the bear got in there. So I appreciate seeing those photos. Mm -hmm. uh, that explains uh, a lot. Yeah. Um, now were you, were you hung on, on one of the uh, parks, wire things that they they put up for that we were yeah the pre-set up bear hangs yeah. Uh, yeah which we've come to recognize is probably not i mean if you're inexperienced at making bear hangs it's it's probably your go-to but you know a better place would probably be, be like way back in the bush somewhere um yeah. and preferably higher i don't know kevin you probably have more to say yeah, we've, we've got a lot of visuals to well, share tonight. So where do you want to start, yeah. Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, why, why don't we start with uh, the, the campsite picture I, I shared with you, um, the, the, with the, the food and the campfire and the tent all separated. I yeah, that one. That one. Um, so so as I told, as we talked last time I was on, you know, I'm, I'm working on a a book about uh, backcountry uh, food. And um, this is the classic, you know, tent cooking area, bear hang spot that you see in every book. But I've never found a campsite like this. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, no. like, you know, sleep away from your cooking areas, uh, your sleep away from your food area. That makes logical sense. But I've never, you know, look at the distance there, 60 meters. Um, I've never been to a campsite like that at all. So, mm -hmm. so, and, and there's a wind direction element to this. And, you know, I don't know how many times I've set up camp and the wind sh shifts uh, a couple times during the evening, uh, especially as temperatures change on, on a lake or something. So, um, so number one, I kind of abandoned that whole concept. Like it, it, it's a concept and it's great to think about, but don't go pace out 200 feet and, and put your, you know, do your best. Like, you, you know, you've got a spot, um, the other one is is the perfect tree. The maybe you put that up next. Yeah, just wanted to say too that uh, like a two two hundred feet 
away from your camp is sort of a guideline. Like you're not, nobody's bringing a tape measure, but I, they're, they're, I guess in yeah. that picture, just yeah. trying to state that you should keep it at least 200 feet away. Cause a lot of people, and I've been guilty of this myself where you're at a campsite and like, you know, at the end of the day and you're just like exhausted from paddling all day, maybe, you know, big portages, whatever. And you set, <laughs> you set the food barrels away from the camp, but you're not 200 feet out. Right. And you throw like, you know, your pots and pans on there and, and your buddy says, yeah, yeah. if I hear the pots I, and pans, I'll wake up. Right. It never <laughs> happens, but you know, I've, I've, uh, you know, even in national parks or provincial park backcountry campsites that are kind of well organized and they've got a bare locker, they're not that distance away. Um, they haven't taken into consideration the prevailing winds. They, they've just put it in a practical spot. So you're going to do your best, right? Like yeah. you're not, you know, um, you're not going to be living and dying by that triangle because um, because it, it often doesn't exist in the wind. You know, the wind's not going to behave for you. At least it never does for me. I don't know about other people on, online here, but it doesn't behave for me. And then no. the, the other one is the perfect tree, right? Um, I've, I've got, let's, I threw that concept up. Yeah, let's, um, uh, there we go. I got perfect a drawing tree. about that. And yeah, I mean, I, ideally you want this magical tree, which um, has a nice branch in certain places, you know, maybe in Algonquin with lots of red pine, you might get a, a good branch that allows you to hang your bag at least five or more feet away from the trunk. Five feet, it actually probably isn't quite enough, uh, but you also want to hang it down from the top because a, a bear can crawl up and, and climb down. Yeah. You're, uh, you're trying to get into that. <laughs> okay. um, I was just peeking. That's all. And so, yeah. And, and so how often, how often do you actually find that set up? Um, yeah. I've often, you know, I've camped above tree line um, where there are no trees. I've camped, I uh, haven't done in the, gone to the tundra, but that exists as well. I've been in areas in the boreal forest where the black spruce are so small that, that there are no branches. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna do that. So um, hanging your food, uh, there's a lot of folks now uh, with lots of experience that are saying, well, it's, it's not always necessary to hang your food. If you're in, I, I sort of categorize it as front country or back country. If you're in the front country where, you know, as, as Julia and um, Chris found, they, they, they found a mess at their campsite. They found trash. So that's kind of front country. And people have been there before. There's a good chance the bears are habituated and they may know what to do when they find a bear hang. So putting up a, a bear hang may or may not be all that practical. Um, there's also, you know, if you... Uh, if you try and set a bear hang, it can be difficult. Uh, just throwing a rock over a tree, just tying a rock uh, to a rope is a challenge. And then throwing it off, and it'll come off. Often it'll swing down and hit you in the head. Um, there's a whole knack to that. I've got a, I've got a bear bag uh, kit here with, with a little baggie uh, that you put rocks in. And, and this is what you throw. And it makes, it makes a world of difference. Um, you want to hold that up and show everybody? So, sure, sure. It's a little baggie that goes with uh, with a larger bag. This is the food bag here. I get my left and right mixed up on this screen here. And there's a little bag here that goes with it. Uh, right now it's got rocks and so you can tie your throw rope to that. Makes it much easier to get over that little hurdle of, of getting your rope up in a tree. Um, but sometimes, you know, your, your food bag or your barrel gets really heavy and that can be hard to hoist. Especially, you know, people are often minimalizing. They're using a very a very small piece of cord, right? And um, the friction, the, the bigger the, the load on the other end, yeah, even if you get this over, I'm a big guy, I can pull a lot of weight, but the friction on a little branch is gonna just make that so hard to pull. So one thing I, I do is I bring, I bring a pulley, um, which makes a big difference. You can tie this, you can throw this over, you can, you can lower it down, put a rope through this and lower it back up. And, and that'll give you a, a friction advantage if you're bringing a, a very thin rope. So that's, that's, another, that's a, another method. Um, so, so if I'm in the front country, I'm gonna hang my bear bag or I'm gonna try my best. Um, often they're bear pinatas. I've, I've seen many campsites where, uh, I was at a site where a whole bunch of people, and I've, I've been guilty of this before, you know, you put all your foot into a big bag and you can't get it up. You got people underneath lifting it and other people pulling on the rope and you get it part way up. And at the end, you go, well, a, a bear is going to be able to reach that. That's just a bear pinata. 
So, mm -hmm. so is that really worth doing or not? But um, in the in the back, sorry, in the front country, I do that all the time. In the back country, honestly, um, you know, I'm in I'm in northern Ontario, right? Um, I I have the luxury of camping in places like Wabakimi and Woodland Caribou, and those are easier destinations for me. And you know, when I'm in when I'm in uh, Woodland Caribou, our last trip, uh, Todd didn't make the show, but our last trip, we saw one other party the whole trip. So the chances of encountering a bear, um, a bear that's habituated to a campsite is pretty low, right? So um, in a longer trip with more people, you're gonna have a bigger food barrel and it becomes more challenging to hoist that as well. So so I, I tend to, in, in those situations where I feel comfortable, I will just tie my barrel to a tree and I'll stack some pots and pans on it and, and um, go to bed and I'll, I'll put bear spray and an ax and some bear bangers in the vestibule of my tent and um, sleep well. Mm -hmm. The, I'm sorry, I'm just reading some of the, the comments here. Everybody <laughs> likes your, your, your pulley idea. It's something that's been a part of our, our kitchen mess kit and uh, tarp system for, for years uh, canoeing. It really, really does make a, a huge difference when it comes to, to hanging. You could throw up the the picture of the three barrels if you want. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, I can do that. That kind of so, illustrates uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a that, that's a two tree hang. Uh, that that yeah, that's on a. They're small barrels, they're twenty liter barrels. They're olive barrels. You can get at a at a food store, and I put U bolts on them. You can see the little bolts at the top, and I number them so I know what I've got. Usually, I do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, but towards the end of the trip, they get a bit mixed up. Um, so that's a two tree hang where I've got a rope from tree to tree. And on that rope, I've got uh, three loops tied, alpine butterfly knots with three pulleys. And I've pulled the food up uh, accordingly. That was a, a two week trip we did with um, our two girls when they were quite young. Um, I, guess that, I guess that was nine years ago because my son, my wife realized she was pregnant with our third one on that trip. Um, so that was, a, a you know, that worked for us on that trip. I had kids like like you guys with Cedar. I was trying to be even more careful than I am now, probably. Um, so that's that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, I, I think the main message it really depends on depends on where you are. Well, that that's the whole thing, right? Like uh, we can get into the great debate: hang or not hang, right? And you have to you have to judge a situation or, or weigh out your situation. Like you say, in a lot of cases, one you can't find any trees to hang by. Right. Uh, let, let's let's take a little poll yeah. of uh, people in the uh, in the chat. If you if you've not been able or if you've been to a campsite where you haven't been able to find a, a, a place to hang, put a number one in the chat. I just want to see. I bet you most people are in that in that case. Right. Uh, even at Algonquin Park, yeah. um, I'll give you a, a quick little example. Last year I did uh, I did a little trip. It was a solo trip up to, to Bonnachere Lake. Uh, started out at Smoke Lake up to Bonnachere. And the campsite that I camped on on Bonnachere, which was across the point from your one of your favorite uh, mm -hmm. sites there, Chris and Julia, mm -hmm. um, there I went back into the bush to find this, like you know, to find some place to hang because there were all kinds of, of there was bear scat all over the place. The one campsite I went to, it was in the spring, early early spring. Uh, I guess a bear had unplugged on the campsite, and just like there was, I'll say it on the show, there was bear shit everywhere, and I'm not talking like piles of. I'm talking like you have to watch the video. It's everywhere. It looks like something exploded, right? <laughs> I get back to where you could tell everybody had been hanging because there were a few trees that had a couple limbs. And all around the area, there were rope pieces hanging down. And below the rope pieces were piles of bear scat. So it was the only place at that campsite where you can actually hang your food, right? So... I hung the food there fully expecting in the morning. I might not have, have anything when I got up because obviously the bears have been getting the food because they've been snapping the ropes. I'm a little jumping up, hanging because I could jump up and touch the rope. Right. But there's not always that condition where you can actually find a place to hang your food. And that's, that's what makes it difficult. You, you can say it till you're blue in the face. Yeah. Hang your food, hang your food. But if there's no place to hang your food, what if you're in a, in a, in an alder area? you know, all, yeah. all small spruces or, or like, you know, it's, it's not possible. 
what are the what things do you do done? Um, so I, I like a two tree method, a two tree bear hang method. If if I, I can't find a tree with good branches, um, if you're in small spruce, it is possible to bend the whole tree down and tie your food to the end of it and then let it go up. A, a bear will have a hard time climbing a very small tree. Um, again, it's just the best you can do. I, I have done that once. Um, yeah, but a, 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 two, a, tree, a two tree method makes a lot of sense. But if, if you're in an area where the bears are habituated, it's gonna do what they did to Chris and Julian, just you know, do the high wire act and get to the middle of it. And that's why you want it to hang down substantially from that, that main line. Mm -hmm. So the, the one thing I also want to point out too, food barrels, the blue food barrels that we talked about that, you know, it says to a bear, eat here, eat here, eat here. People call them bear barrels quite often thinking that they don't give off scent of food, uh, that your food is well protected within there. I just wanted to share a picture here that I found on the internet as well. And this is what a bear can actually do to one of them barrels. Yeah. Uh, that's nothing for a bear. Nothing for a bear. You know, if they if they want what's inside, they will get what's inside. Um, yeah. You know. And we, we've always known that they're not bear proof. Yeah. Um, uh, you always see that bear that's been, sorry, that barrel that's been shredded apart uh, at Canoe Lake when you make your reservation or yeah. you, you pick up your reservation. Um, but we would still, like, we would still use them uh, because mm -hmm. we think, and people have asked us, would you still use them afterwards? Then yes, we will still continue to use them because we, we do appreciate them. Um, I think one thing that we learned that we didn't know was that a bear could open the clasp on the barrel. Um, and so that's something that we, we highlighted in the video was, you know, we now put a ring through the clasp uh, so that it can't be opened. Um, so I think that that was an important thing to share uh, because we had no idea that a bear could open up that class. Um, yeah. And when we were out on the Minas Link earlier this summer, like every night we had a little ring uh, through that, that class uh, so that there was just no chance. Uh -huh. Julia, did you I see saw that in your video and I thought that was a really, really good idea. Yeah. Uh, Julia, did you see the pictures I posted of the bear? Oh, yeah, Julia. Uh, you, uh, this is how the bear got your food barrel. You <laughs> climbed up the tree, found a rope or, or the cable. <laughs> it's amazing. Bears are talented. Yeah. 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 I, I was impressed by that bear. I was very impressed. They as really well. are. Especially <laughs> given the size. Now, the, 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 the hanging uh, cables that they have there, are they actually metal cable? Yeah, the ca the cable that goes across with a pulley on it was metal, yeah, um, or steel cable. Uh, but the rope that went up and down was uh, was a typical like climbing rope, I'd say. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And we we did find lots of scratches on it. So at one point or another, the bear was, you know, physically abrading the surface somehow. So. Yeah. Uh, the bear, the bear had been there a few times, and you're probably not the first meal that. Uh, yeah. Your food wasn't its first meal from from people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, that's crazy. Okay, so Kevin, what what's the likelihood of a of a bear encounter? Now, we won't say within a provincial park, but say for instance, if you're in the back country, what what are the chances of a bear? Like, are they are they frequent? More frequent than we we expect, or are yeah. they? So I've I've been doing some research um, on an upcoming video. I, I don't know when I'm going to release it, but I'm just I'm looking at bear fatalities. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go through the list of bear fatalities that occurred and I'm I'm reading the uh, at least two stories about each encounter if I can. Um, and, I, and I just before the show, I, did, I it's all in a spreadsheet. So I did a sort for Ontario. Um, and I, you know, I'm not trying to dramatize this, but it, this, this is what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid getting killed by a bear um, or being harmed by a bear. So um, forgive me if this is a bit morbid, but in the last 29 years, so 1991 was was the first um, bear human human fatality caused by bears that's on record. I'm sure they occurred before that, but if you if you go back in history, 1991, Algonquin Park, um, a woman was I believe it was a woman um, was killed by a bear. Since then, there have been five fatalities in Ontario. Um, so you know we get about two per decade in Ontario. Um, 
The last two uh, were in my neck of the woods. Last summer, uh, a gentleman was killed. Um, an older gentleman was killed picking berries near Red Lake. Um, he was alone, um, killed by a bear, predatory attack. Um, and a woman in, tw in 2019 was killed in the Fort Francis area. She was out with her dogs, um, walking her dogs at her camp on an island. And um, unfortunately, she was killed. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely rare that bears, usually they're, they're habituated and they want to go for your food. Um, but occasionally they turn predatory and occasionally they see a human as a meal. Um, it's very rare, but the more time you spend in the back country, the more likely you're going to encounter something like that. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a shame Todd couldn't make it on here because he had a, a predatory encounter. Um, he's someone I work with and I know a number of other people. If you Google Todd Moore bear attack, there's an article about his attack. Um, the link is in the description below. I've got several other friends because I work in, yeah, because I work in forestry. I know a lot of folks and it's a, it's a small community. Um, whether you work for industry or government or a consulting company, you know, we all kind of know each other. We all went to school together, different age ages, of course. But, um, and so I know a lot of people that have had predatory attacks and have had to discharge spray. I'm not going to tell Todd's story because I, I think it belongs to him. And, um, you know, I like to tell stories, but um, it's his story. But the details are that he was pursued by a predatory bear. He went for a swim in the lake to avoid the bear. He spent hours in the water, um, you know, getting hypothermic to avoid the bear. Um, and, and the big difference, uh, while, we're, while we're talking about the, the differences here, is that um, a habituated bear is going to go for your food. They're going to be very aggressive. They're going to make a lot of noise. They're going to have that stress behavior. They're going to chomp and blow and um, sometimes clap their jaw. Uh, they'll do all that. Uh, a predatory bear is going to be a lot more quiet. They, they will attend, occasionally do a bit of demonstration for you, but they're going to be quiet and they're not going to come straight on. They're, they're going to tend to try and get around you. They're going to be very slow try and walk around you and, and get you from behind. They're going to be persistent. They're trying to get you to trip and fall down and go for you. Um, so I, I know a bunch of people that have had that experience. Um, another friend of mine went in the lake, just like Todd. Uh, if you Google Rob Foster, he's a consultant. Um, Rob Foster bear attack, you'll find his story. He, <laughs> he, he discharged bear spray and saved himself once. And an exact year to the day, he had another attack. He's a guy who's out in the bush all the time. He makes his living uh, doing environmental assessment work. Um, another, another someone you can Google is Laura Darby, who uh, worked for us. Um, worked, worked, she's a colleague of mine. She was attacked uh, by a bear, um, very badly hurt. She would have been dead if her partner didn't get her out um, and, and signal for help. So it, it does happen. Fatalities are rare, but the more time you spend in the bush, uh, you know, the chances of running into a, a true predator um, go up. And, and, and they used, typically those, those attacks are, are deeper into the back country. What, what might trigger a bear to do something like that though? Like typically bears are, are like, yeah. They, 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 they tend to eat more berries and stuff like that, you know, maybe fish scraps or scraps or like a rotting carcass or stuff. But what, what would trigger an animal that doesn't usually attack to attack to become a predator, predatory bear? Would it be yeah. the, the sex of the animal? And, or And for, for, for black bears, it, it, yeah, for, for black bears, it seems to be, and, and the classic thinking, and one of the reasons I got into making videos about bears and I'm no expert either but I've, I've been reading a lot doing a lot of research trying to make good videos and I know folks that have had real encounters um it, it tends to be um bears that are healthy it tends to be large males that are that are back in the in the wilderness or back country who are you know there's a lot of theories but one theory is they get to a metabolic state where they they're done with berries and roots. They're, they're going after protein. Um, that's one theory. We don't really know for sure. Um, one, one of my friends who uh, had an encounter similar to Todd, his name is Phil. Um, he had a, a predatory bear and afterwards um, it was realized that 
he was near a dump that had closed. So it was probably a habituated bear that out of frustration started looking for, for humans. But, but it's quite rare. There's a woman killed by a, a grizzly bear in a lot, um, I believe it was uh, British Columbia uh, a couple years ago. And, and that bear was emaciated and sick. Um, and that's what we all think of is that it's a sick bear that's gonna attack you. And occasionally that's true, but often it's a very healthy bear that, that uh, does the attack. Mm -hmm. Wow. You, you just never know. Eh? It's always to have, good to have eyes in the back of your head. Uh, just for everybody that's in the, uh, in the chat, if you want to look up the article, uh, uh, Todd was supposed to be on the show tonight. Couldn't make it for uh, whatever reason, but his link to his story on his, uh, his bear encounter when he was actually stalked by the bear is uh, in the description below. Uh, give the article a read. It's not a very long article. It's uh, by CBC, but uh, it's very interesting because he not only had one encounter, but his dog had a, a rather scary encounter too with, I believe it was a Wolverine or something. <laughs> so that, that's a very interesting read. Very interesting read. Um, wanna, wanna, we have a lot of people asking about ursacs. Uh, we, we talked about food, well, the food barrels, whether it's a green or a blue barrel or whatever. Uh, people want to know about ursacs, which I, I have an ursac and I, I've, I've started to really like using it for my solo tripping. But uh, what can you tell us about ursacs? Uh, I know you got a video. Do you not have one? Or we have a video? Well, I, I've got one here. And, I, and we put, yeah, we got a video as well. This, this, this is an ursac. Yeah, you can play the video. It's. Um, okay. I, I guess when, when mine first came out, it was advertised in Kevlar, but it's. Um, it's that other material now, the um, ultra high, you, you know, I can't remember the, the the scientific name, UHDWP or whatever it is. Um, they're they're, they're very resistant. Um, they are not bear proof. They are bear resistant. Um, you can hold that up. Sure, before. sure. I'll back up a little bit. This is uh, what the bag looks like. And uh, yeah. Most of the ones they and sell it's, now. Uh, it's a very buy. strong material. That uh, you know, you can you can probably yeah, they're mostly black now. Although sometimes they sell the white and the black. You could puncture it with a knife or a, a pin, but you're not going to rip it. Um, it's it's extremely strong. And um, I, I live in bear country, so I've I've got some trail cameras, and we actually have a video of one. I made a video of of, of uh, animals trying to get into my uh, my earth sack. I put I put some sardines. Opened a can of sardines to be very appealing to bears and I, I i live in an area where you know there's nobody camping around me it's rural it's quite a distance and the bears aren't very habituated but i, I opened a can of sardines put it in the earth sack and uh, hung it up you know <laughs> 200 feet that direction or 200 meters that direction um and we can show that video if if you like yeah i'll uh I'll, let's put this video up here and while this video is playing, I'm actually going to. We got a bit of lag going here, so there just you go. bear with us for a moment here. There we go. I'm just going to run off and grab my ursac. Well, that's playing. You can describe the video if you want. Yeah. So this is just a minute long, but you can see the bear uh, really tugging on it. And I, I was amazed the bear gave up after a couple minutes. Um, it really liked the scent. It really liked the taste. Um, there's quite a reward in there. So I was really surprised the bear gave up. That that bag has a bunch of holes in it now from the bear teeth. Um, and so ursacs are good. They're going to keep the bear from getting your food. But really what you're trying to do is prevent a bear from getting a reward. So, you know, for the sake of the video, th this bear got a reward. Um it's it's got all that sardine oil and it's it's liking the scent on its on its fur, um, but you really want to prevent the bear from getting a reward, especially in a camping situation. Um, so if you have oil in your earth sack um, or anything like that, the bear can bite through. Um, that will leak and the bear will get a reward. And you know you 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 move towards a habituated bear. Um, so so they have their place. Um, I use my earth sack. Yeah, when, when I'm not uh, getting my ursac wrecked with uh, sardines, which I still can't get out of that one. Oh, you got you got the black one. Yeah, I've, um, got, I've got a newer version. You know, I, I use them in areas that are. 
Yeah, and basically nice. it's uh I can't even remember the name yeah. of the material myself, but it's uh they're very tough, but in hindsight, I'm thinking, you know, if the bear gets it and he's like chomping on it, he might not get your food, but he's certainly going to destroy your food, right? Yeah, he'll destroy your food. And if you have an oil or something that'll leak, he'll they'll get a reward, which is not what you're trying to do. So they have their place for backpacking where you're trying to cut weight. Um, and in places where you're, you know, you're not going to get a lot of bear encounters. Um and you can hang them. It can be your practice. I'm going to hang my bear bag all the time. There we go. Um, U-H-M-W. I always get that wrong. Um, you can hang your bear bag all the time. And if you get to a spot without a good tree, you could tie it to a tree the way I did. Um, and, and again, do your best in the situation you're in. Now, for these ursacs, I believe they make uh, little bear vaults that you could put inside of them. They're like a, a plasticized bear vault, um, which will contain any liquids, or they also suggest that uh, this company here, OPSAC, which I think is the same company as, as them, they make these uh, scent-proof Ziploc baggies that you can put your food in. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you have yeah. a video on that too, do you not? Or we have? I do, I do, if you wanna play that yeah. one. So Let's I was skeptical, I did, a, uh, I did a video of, I did a video, a video, a video. I did a video about uh, bears and scent, and this is the op sack. So I made a little wooden uh, pouch and I hung, um, again, an open can of sardines, but in a sealed OP sack. Um, to, so the, the bear's attracted to it. Again, this is not a habituated bear. This is a Kuglin's odor-proof bag. And the bear, the, the bear's picking it up. Like bears have a tremendous sense of smell. Um, and I think the bear knows there's something there. Um, in a second here, it's going to jump up and, Put its nose right on that box um but you know bloodhounds can smell drugs hidden away um and the drug dealers are, are trying hard to seal their bags too and, and make them odor resistant and bears have a way better sense of smell than bloodhounds so yeah he's i i think because and again we don't know we don't know everything about bears i'm no expert i think the bears smelling through that odor proof bag and finding the uh finding the sardines but i think it's not a habituated bear therefore it's not going further it doesn't know there's a reward there that that's my theory um like to hear other mm -hmm. theories interesting so this research or like the, these video snippets that you have is that that on your property or is that it's on my property yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's on my property a... just a few hundred meters across the beaver pond Excellent. And while we're at it there, uh, we have the other picture that you sent me. Uh, the reason why I had Kevin come on is because he does have a whole video playlist on his YouTube channel about uh, all kinds of bear stuff. So I would, I would, the link is down, down in the description there again uh, for his whole video playlist. Go spend some time and watch. If you're, if you're really wondering about bears, he covers a lot in there. Um, he was talking about scents. I'll let you explain this one too, Kevin. Sure. Um, you know, we humans often put stuff away in a bag and, and uh, you know, we use bloodhounds to find narcotics. We use them to detect cancer. We use them for all kinds of things to locate missing people. Um, and, and one way, you know, none of us really know what it's like to have a bear's nose, but you can, can, you can uh, calculate the scent receptors in their nose and bears have millions more than humans and they have uh, black bears especially have way more uh, scent receptors than uh, the best dogs bloodhounds um and so and they also have a, a very big uh, olfactory bulb the, the part of their brain the processor if you will that processes smells it's it's huge it's about 10 times that of a human so um you know, it's thought based on this evidence that they have a tremendous sense of smell way better than, than bloodhounds. And we use bloodhounds for such amazing things. Um, I like to tell people if, if you were going to play hide and seek, what would you do as a human? Well, you'd start looking around and listening, but if you're a dog and you're playing hide and seek, the first thing you're going to do is smell the note, smell the air, right? You're going to look and, and that if you, if you're a dog owner, that's what they do. They smell the air to figure out what's going on. Um, they rely on their sense of smell. It's probably like 
techno vision for them, right? Like it, it's it's just very very different. We can't imagine what it's like. So so folks put their food away in a barrel, and I'm not saying that's not good. I'm just saying recognize that you know when you get your blue barrel hanging there, the bear knows that's where your food is. He's not sniffing around your tent wondering if you got food in your tent. They know it's in your barrel because um, they can smell through the barrel. Um, mm -hmm. But all that all that stuff that you do, bring dried food, uh, sealing your food in bags, putting it in a barrel, sealing the barrel, that cuts down on the odors. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And a bear at a distance might not care about you, which is great. Um, but if there's a bear in your campsite, you can't hide that food from the bear um, at all. Yeah. Now, I know some provincial parks and, and such are starting to install um, uh, food vaults on campsites. I guess, especially in areas where bears yeah. are frequent. I can't understand why Algonquin doesn't have them yet, uh, given given the amount of problems that they have with with uh, with wildlife. One thing I want to go on record as saying, too, with this show tonight, is we are talking about bears, but same thing goes for any wild animal. It could, it could even be a chipmunk, okay? Yeah, a chipmunk might not kill you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they are still hunting for your food. <laughs> Okay. And mm -hmm. even, even the mice in camp, you know, they, they come out, they know when to come out. They come out at nighttime when nobody's watching and they, they can get into your stuff. And the thing that they're all after is your food. So the best thing you could do is try and safeguard against that. You know, how, how many people have gone family camping and uh, woke up in the morning and their cooler has been ripped open by a, uh, you know, a whole family of raccoons. Uh, we've had raccoons at our campsite yeah. eating out of our dog dish when you're, when we were family camping. So it's not, this isn't only just about bears, although the topic is bears, it has to do with any type of wildlife that wants your food type of thing, right? But okay, so I, I was mentioning about the, the food vaults. Why, why, why is it that all these provincial parks are not installing these things to, they do it for garbage? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can't answer that question, but I, I, I do know that where they install them, it's to protect bears and humans um mm -hmm. and i've got a couple pictures of them if you want to yeah. put one up you can um but we can all imagine a metal box right uh, that's foolproof this 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 was in jasper uh, a few years ago um th this is in the back country this is in the uh the tonkin valley in the back country they were just starting to step set them up um bear locker for each campsite uh bear proof um and that's gonna deny bears any reward they could possibly get. Um, I've got another one of an older system. This is in Puckasaw National Park uh, on Lake Superior. So they've got easy water access. They can bring this in. And um, again, foolproof, bears are not going to get a reward. Um, way better than a bear hang, way more reliable and way more secure. Mm -hmm. I, I especially like food storage only, no garbage. Because I'm sure everybody yeah. listens to that, right? Yeah. So, well, it's not that, to leave your garbage, right? People will leave their garbage and go away. <laughs> no, why, why would you do that in Algonquin Park? You could just put it right down the Thunderbox, no? Yeah, or in the fire yeah. pit. I, I or think in the fire pit, yeah. Which, which can bring us on to another topic, okay? So, do you burn your food scraps in your garbage if you can, or do you not, right? there. Here's, a, here's another one. Like I say, what we're saying tonight, everybody, is is not is not the written rule, okay? Because you have to use your own common sense in any of these situations. But me, I'll, I'll say honestly, for the most part, if there's scrap food, I'm burning it. I'm not carrying it out. I'm not going to pack it and carry it some more. You know what I mean? If my dog doesn't finish it, which she usually does, so it's not very often we're burning food. But if I have to, I will burn the food, okay? What's your take on that? Chris and Julie, I'll ask you guys that. So, I mean, we definitely have burned our food. I think when it's burnt to a crisp, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a bear expert, but I assume that if it's burnt to a crisp, that it's not really going to be providing a delicious scent. Um, I'm always surprised at the number of glass bottles or cans that are in the fire pit. And I'm like, that's, it's not an incinerator. Those are not going to burn in a fire pit. Um, so that, um, obviously, I would not encourage. Yeah, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Always surprised by how much garbage we find in the in the fire pit. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, what's I think. Take, what's your take there, uh, Kevin? I, I think I think you know you're you're emitting so much smells when you're cooking. You you, you know if if you throw some bacon and eggs on, um, bears from everywhere around you are going to pick that up. And so burning food at the end of that is is pretty minor. Um, sure, and and they, and they probably they're probably smart enough. We don't know. We can't ask a bear. But they're as um, Julia said, they're probably smart enough to realize that's that food is burnt. I don't want that. <laughs> like, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, but that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's important to recognize that uh, when Julia talks about burning food in the fire pit, like it's it is burnt beyond recognition, and it's been burning in there for like an oh. hour, and it's it's just it's toast. Uh, well, not toast, but. <laughs> But yeah, it's, <laughs> it's completely gone. <laughs> but no uh, pun intended. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. But uh, I think I I would encourage everybody to just like leave it burning in there for a really, really, really long time, and not just like scorch it or or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got to be beyond recognition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Toast. Yeah, that, yeah. Hey, but you I know what? On the same on the same note, if if I have tin foil or if I have and it's not very often I have anything tin other than perhaps tin foil. Like I won't have cans and stuff like that. But if I did have to burn it, I will burn it off just to try and burn off the scent. But then again, after that, after it's cooled, it goes into the trash bag to go out with me. Yeah. You know, with, with the beer cans when I'm on Crown Land, right? Yeah. So <laughs> uh, even there again, there, there's a big one. I know a lot of people like to burn, uh, burn their beer cans because they will melt, right? But they don't take out. The scrap aluminum right so here's this aluminum still sitting within a fire pit right so you, ha you have to be responsible people and carry this stuff out because you never know what kind of scent can be left behind and it was probably the root of the cause why you guys had a bear in your camp on that particular weekend right yeah leave no trace it's yeah. it's the way to go yeah, yeah. cool Okay, you know what? We're we're at eight o'clock. I'd like to get the uh, swag giveaway out of the uh, way here, and then what we'll do is we'll we'll carry on with a bit more, and we'll invite some people on panel perhaps to to maybe add to the conversation, or um, you know maybe ask some questions, and we'll try and get get through a lot more of this because I do want to uh, what you should do like how to handle a bear encounter, right? If uh, if you are approached, um, the effectiveness of bear sprays, whistles. Um, bear bells, uh, air horns, stuff like that. Uh, and what you should do if you encounter a bear, say for instance, in a provincial park, you know what I mean? Uh, how should you go about reporting that? So we'll get to all that stuff in a short moment here. Um, Kevin and uh, Chris and Julie, I'm just gonna drop you down for a bit so I could do this swag giveaway. Good chance to go get yourself a beverage or whatever else you might need to do for the next minute. And uh, I'll have you back up in a second. Yep. And there. All right, guys and gals. So uh, here we are, 8 o'clock hour. I just wanted to uh, get this swag giveaway out of the way so that we can get back, back on with this really interesting topic. Uh, for tonight's swag giveaway, I'm going to ask a question. Please do not put it over here in the chat. I, what I need you to do is I need you to send me your answer to coasprize at gmail.com, and I'll get that going across here right there. So that's the uh, the email address. Send me your answers by uh, Saturday at 11 p.m. And at that time, we will do our drawing. I'll notify the winner, and then we'll also make the announcement next week of who the swag giveaway winner is. And uh, for the swag giveaway this week, uh, not as big as the past couple of weeks, but we do have a Canoe Hound uh, Adventures prize pack consisting of decals, some patches. Uh, we also got some Algonquin Outfitter uh, goodies that uh, we're going to throw into the mix here. And if I find something else that I'd like to uh, throw in, I will do that as well. I just don't know what yet. Anyways, tonight's question is, and we discussed this a little earlier, what is the recommended distance from camp that you should hang a food bag or food barrel if you are hanging your food? How far from your camp? Uh, we did discuss it. We actually put a diagram up uh, that Kevin explained. And uh, if you can't remember what it is, just go on back into the video, have a look. And uh, you'll be able to send me the right answer. If you don't send me the right answer, I will get back to you and let you know that I want you to be in the in the prize there, the swag giveaway. I'll give you a, a snippet of where you can actually go find the correct answer. Send me back the answer, and we'll make sure we have you in there for the draw. So anyways, I'll just leave that on screen here for a minute so that uh, you can all get that out of the way. 
and I will bring Kevin back up on panel. Welcome back. Hello. <laughs> and we've got Chris. And Chris is eating. You know what? Funny thing that you're eating and what Kevin just said about a dog. You know, uh, first thing they do is they come in their nose in the air. My wife <laughs> got home with the dog. I got my bowl of Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> right away, the nose is in the air. Oh, dad's got food now. She's laying beside me. So um, nice. it's amazing the sniffers that these critters have for sure. All righty. So uh, I'm going to put the link to tonight's uh, live stream in the chat. And if anybody would like to join us, feel free to come on up and uh, ask any questions or maybe add to the conversation because we all learn, we are all learning from each other. And it's a great way to do so. Don't be shy. Come on up. And ba-boom, there's the link. So hope to see some of you in the chat below. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so we want to get into uh, handling a bear encounter. Um, we Anybody who's seen Chris and Julia's video knows how they handled this. And I, I think you handled it quite well. Uh, maybe got a little cl too close to the bear for my liking, but uh, <laughs> what, what's the point? I didn't want to hurt the bear. I'm like, it's just hungry. It's just a, like another being. I don't like. Oh, I wanted to scare it with my with my voice. I, I told Chris that I, I really like the way you said you're a big, beautiful animal. <laughs> like I want to hurt the bear. Yeah. You're, you give it way too much respect. <laughs> I, I still can't believe the bear got as close as it did to Julia. Like I, it blows my mind that she's, she was that close to the bear and handled it so well, uh, especially a bear of that size. Like it just blows my mind every time I think about it. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, my hat's off to you. <laughs> I, well, thank you for telling me to take the safety off the bear spray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. I, um, we do have a couple of people already in the basement. Uh, Mallory, I see you. Mark, I see you there as well. But I, I just want to ask, Kevin, so a bear comes into your camp or you see a bear on the trail. What's the first thing that you should start doing to tell this thing, like, get the hell away? I don't want you around here. Yeah, um, I would say grab your bear spray first and pull it out and take off the safety. Like, number one, get that out. Um, have it, always have it handy. Mine is, um, you know, a lot of a lot of canoers here. Um, I, it's best to have it on your belt so that when you pull it, and I'll be very careful that it comes out of the holster really quickly. Um, but it's better to have it on you than to have it like super secure. So, on portages, I bring a carabiner. Um, I watched uh, Julia's video about how important carabiners are to cameras. Um, <laughs> See if she gets that or not. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was the. I just measured the delay. Um, but you know, a carabiner is going to mean that on a portage, you're going to bring it with you um, because it's easy. Um, so, so that's what I do. Number one, pull it out, and I would say talk to that bear. People always comment on my videos, "Wow, well, you can't talk to a bear," but you're just establishing your presence as uh, as Chris did, um, letting it know you're there, letting it know you're confident. Um, you know, normally I would say be super, super loud with a black bear. Um, but you know, the situation is different. If you're hiking on a trail and you run into a bear, that's one situation. If you're established at camp and you got a kid in the tent, that's a different situation. So, um, you might be in for the long haul. Uh, so don't waste all your energy, uh, yelling at the bear. Um, I would say that with a, a black bear, um, give it that spray, um, point down and uh, it, you know towards its face, have it ready so that all you have to do is pull the, the trigger with your thumb um, as you guys did. Um, that's perfect. That's uh, that's textbook when it gets in the, and g give it a good blast and have a second one. Like the second one doesn't have to be super handy. One needs to be super handy. The second one needs to be somewhere that you know where it is, probably with your rain gear or something. Um, this is gonna give you some time, a full blast of this should effectively paralyze a bear for a while. Um, even a small blast will. Uh, a couple of years ago, I we had like 20 of these at work and they all expired and I like didn't know how to discharge them. There's no real great way to get rid of old ones. Um, so I took them all home and I discharged them myself. And uh, after discharging 20, I, one of them, I got a small whiff, uh, the breeze picked up, I got a small whiff of it and it 
it got half my face and that whole side of my face was swollen. My eye was swollen shut. I was in pain. Um, there's no long lasting effects. So you don't worry about the bear. Like it, it'll get over it in an hour or two. Um, but it's, it's, it's paralyzing to get a, to get that in your face and it should be paralyzing for the bear and you should have time to get away. And if necessary, find that other, other canister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just posted a, a thing there from Brian J saying, uh, but me dumb and I leave it in my pack, not on my belt. That may change. Yeah, it's no good if it's uh, packed away. You need to have it uh, by your ready all the time, right? Uh, we do have a few people down in the basement here. We'll start with uh, Mallory from Quebec Homesteading. Hi, Mallory. How are you doing tonight? Hi, I'm good. Good, Hi. good. Got a question for the panel tonight? I do, actually. First of all, awesome information, Kevin. That is awesome because I have 200 acres and a beaver pond and a lot of bears. <laughs> And just right in my backyard, you know. <laughs> Get some and trail I'm, cameras I'm, and you can do a lot of YouTube video. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, I tried to catch them on drone, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's never happened. But um, I have been told, because I have I live way up there in the mountains, and there's a lot of wind. And so I've been told out here that bear spray is pretty much useless. And so I was wondering what your thoughts were on, I saw these things, they're called true flare pen launchers. They like blast, you can direct the blast to scare the animal. I was wondering what your thoughts were on those. Um, these are great. I, I bring them with me. Um, they have signal flares. I'll hold it up. You open it up and uh, this one's got a waterproof case. It's got a little launch pen. Again, I get the left, right. Yeah, uh, it's got a safety and you pull it all the way back and let it go. Um, before you do that, you screw in one of the bear bangers, which is uh, got some explosive in it. Um, I would say like anything, uh, try it out first. Uh, yeah. These things are loud. Um, ide ideally, you probably want to send them straight up um, because they travel a long way. They're very loud. They're like a gunshot. It sounds like a shotgun just went off. Um, and, uh, but you can send them behind the bear. If you point it towards the bear, they can go behind the bear yeah. and explode behind the bear. And if it's afraid of that, it's going to, it's going to come at you. So, yeah. um, best advice is unless you're in a, in the mountains and have a really good view, like a hundred meters, um, cause these things will travel that far, send it straight up. It'll make a noise. A lot of folks, uh, you know, I work in forestry, a lot of folks, uh, use these and they're supplied these for, for for safety reasons they can scare off a bear and they they almost always do the first time but if a bear gets used to it they they tend to not work the bear will will come bug you again if it, okay. if it learns so um so these work I also, I also have an air horn these are cheaper yeah um i won't squeeze this because it scares me to do oh. it outside and uh don't um, do it my, my, my family my, my family won't appreciate this we all know what um, they sell. they work really well yeah they, they they're about uh 10 bucks for one of those yeah. um and they, they they're very effective but i i would you know bear spray in the wind is is a very controversial thing a lot of people say it doesn't work because of the wind i've rarely been in wind strong enough the the, the new um yeah. I get the name of the company wrong. Oh, this is this is not the right company. But there's I'm like fully exposed. Oh, like there's wind the everywhere the here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Counter Assault is the name of the company. They make one that grows 15 or 20 meters now, which is which is a good distance. You, you should try one. You should you should they sell inert ones. Yeah. Um, people should try one just to get a feel of how powerful it is. Yeah. And then you'll know what kind of a wind you should use it in. And I've discharged these. I would use it personally in a very strong wind. If a yeah. bear's coming at me, if it's a predatory bear, if it's, if it's a habituated bear, I might just back off a little bit, let it have the food. But if it's a predatory bear, I'm going to spray it in almost any wind condition. Yeah. If I get a little bit of whiff, so what? I'm, I'm going to be in pain. I know that. I'll get away. I'll have my senses. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you'll get with, sprayed, with lag, but he's not going to eat you, right? <laughs> I remember one time in a discussion a long time ago. You yeah, mentioned yeah, about, uh, you I just I mentioned about uh, expired uh, cans and what do you do with them? And I believe it was uh, Pine Martin. Martin Pine had uh, said that use it use it to practice with. If you have an expired one, rather than like trying to find a way yeah. of disposing, 
take it take it somewhere where there's nobody around. Uh, maybe make a target on a tree, a little uh, somebody you don't like, uh, put a picture of their face on a tree and yeah. practice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to champion yeah. the the video that Kevin put up about the effectiveness of bear spray. Like Kevin actually shows the the research and the data, and I think. Kevin, you did a great job of highlighting that I think like 98% of bear encounters that use bear spray uh, come away with a positive outcome. So I think I, I would highly yeah. recommend watching uh, Kevin's yeah. video on bear spray because it's highly effective, highly effective. Yeah, I just I just found out about him tonight, so I'm definitely going to go look at it because I've been I've yeah. been. I've been scared for ever since Ben, my my husband, came into a big encounter with a big bear uh, during hunting season. I'm just like, I'm just too scared to go <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so, well, you, can't, you can't let it scare you and keep you out. That's why we're talking about this here, so you could actually learn something, so you're not afraid to go out there, right? So, yeah, and like I have small children, and like me by being by myself with the two girls in the woods, like that scares me, like. Yeah. I need I need to figure out ways to get over it. Yeah. Cool. Cool. <laughs> well, we do have a couple more people in the basement. Um, if you, had, you yeah. have any follow up that you'd like to ask there before I drop you into the basement there? Uh, no, Mark? no, I'm all good. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for coming up. I appreciate it. All right. Talk soon. Yeah. Bye. And next, uh, we'll bring up here uh, Mark from the OG in the canoe, and I see you down there too, Ben. I'll have you up in a sec. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Good. Hello. Good. So I actually, a couple of weeks ago, I actually had the privilege of asking Chris about in the after show about this exact topic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'd just like to say, like, before I ask my my question to Kevin, um, I just want to say, Julia, you were like Will Smith in Men in Black with that bear. You were like, it was incredible. Incredible. Thank you. <laughs> it was, yeah. We, me, me and my friend were actually just talking about it tonight. And we're like, she was, he actually said that he's like, well, I thought that, you know, maybe Julia would be in the tent with, you know, with Cedar and Chris had more experience. I'm like, no, actually, Julia has more experience than Chris in the backcountry. So, you know, yeah. Julia has a lot more experience than I yeah. do. Julia is the one who got me into the backcountry. But uh, it also just happened that you were in the tent and I was outside of the tent when the bear came. Yeah, but, but Julia, for the record, Julia is the one who got me into camping. But you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I know that. Uh, that's what I was telling him. He didn't realize that. But I think yeah. Julia was like, you know, she went fisticuffs with the bear. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I think Julia did, did exactly what she needed to do in that situation, though. You know, you, you were very loud. You made yourself look big. You know, you were you were banging pots and pans and, uh, you know, you're doing what you needed to 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 show the bear that you're not taking its scuff. Right. So, uh, these are all, all the things and you give it a little spritz of uh, some pepper spray too, but next time let him have it. <laughs> <laughs> let him have it. Man. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, what, what have you got, uh, Chris or, uh, Mark, you have a question? Yeah, for so my, my, my question was Ke earlier, Kevin mentioned that he, he referred to bears further out in the back country being a little bit, more dangerous if you will than bears in the four country i've always thought that it, like the, the contrary just because like when when i've been encountered like you know i've encountered bears in the past and in, in like deep in the back country and they've been no problem whatsoever whereas bears like when i was like car camping with my trailer or you know like whatever have been more like oh you know yeah. i'm not going anywhere you know so I was just wondering, like, like I was curious yeah. about that because I've never heard anybody explain bears in the backcountry being yeah. more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, there's a good question because there's a lot of nuance to this. And I, I wouldn't say that bears are generally more dangerous in the backcountry, but you're going to find predatory bears in the backcountry more often. Um, they tend to be bigger. They tend to have bigger territories. They're, they're probably solitary males, although a lot of mothers and cubs have been predatory as well. Um, in, the, in the front country, you're going to find those habituated bears that are after your food. And it, it seems like, you know, that's one style of behavior bears can pick up is on a dirty campsite. As Chris and Julie said, you know, there was lots of mess. That bear, it wasn't their fault that they had trouble with the bear. It was the previous camper's fault. Um, so leave no trace, but it tends to be that where bears 
have, um, you know, killed somebody or, or been predatory, it tends to be in the back country. Um, not always, but it, it, it just tends to be more often that way. But, but see, like the, the, the stories that I've heard, like about bear attacks, like, you know, there was a bear attack on an island in Opiango, which is an access point. You know, there's motorboats there. Yeah. There's people that go there with coolers. You know, where Chris and Julia went, it was very close to an access point. There was the the pre-bear hang up and everything else. So obviously people go there for weekends. So to me, like for me yeah. to go in the middle of nowhere and, you know, have to throw my bear rope over the top, you know, be it near the thunder box or where, wherever we find a, to me that I feel safer being out there than I yeah. would being closer to like an access point or just because yeah. like the, I, I would the say the need don't know they they might smell the food but they don't know it's always there yeah and then they won't care about it um oh sorry I was just gonna say would it be ahead. fair that you're you're more likely to have a bear encounter in the four country but if you do have a bear coming in close contact with you in the four country it's more likely to be after your food Whereas if you're deep in the back country and the bear actually comes close to you and starts approaching you, then it's more likely to be a predatory bear. But, but see, on, honestly, like I've, I've had encounters in the four country. I've had counters in the back country and the four country bears, they just kind of just didn't, they just didn't go away. They were just kind of hanging around and whatever. Whereas the back country bears, like I've had more encounters yeah. in the back country than I have in the four country. And we just kind of make a bunch of noise. Yeah. You know, like, and they just kind of go away yeah. or, you know, we have a buddy snoring in the hammock and they're gone, you know? Yeah. Most encounters are like that. Um, it, I, I wouldn't wager to guess how few bears become predatory, but some do. And um, I live in a rural area and I think problem bears probably get killed with lead poisoning, right? I've got farmers and hunters around. Um, it's, it's when you get deeper, I, I agree they're, they're less problematic. I'm less worried in the back country than I am in front country. Um, I think, I don't know if it's Chris or Julia said that, um, you know, probably weren't in any danger, but it was a heck of an experience, right? Cause that bear wants their food. That bear wants their bear barrel. It's not really interested in them. It's, it's, it's giving a big display to get the food. Um, my buddy Todd, who who had an experience, was deep in the back country, um, and that's when the bear like wasn't a huge bear. Um, he says it gets bigger every time he tells a story, but it was <laughs> after him, and it, and it it was it was persistent, um, and it was trying to get around him, and it wasn't being all that aggressive, but it was being persistent, and that's a predatory bear. Those attacks are very rare, but they do happen, and it. Now, now some of them happen in the front country. I've 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 heard of that, and I'm I'm going through a lot of bear attacks just um, as some research for another video, and and some, you know, this is terrible, but some people get killed by bears, you know, plucking people off a porch of their house or in their yard. So so they're not 100% um, back country bears, but when you look at all the numbers, it tends to be that uh, it's people working way far in the back. Uh, country that 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 have those predatory experiences. You know, the, the funny part is, is a lot of a lot of what we've been talking about tonight is is a lot of people are probably assuming that we're just talking about, you know, Algonquin, Killarney uh, or any other provincial park or park wherever you may be, for that matter. But uh, th this deals with like all backcountry. I, I could say from personal experience that in my 30 plus years of, of backcountry canoeing and camping um uh, i have never been faced with a bear uh the closest encounter i've had is waking up in the morning and having had a bear leave a pile of scat just outside of my tent uh and had no idea it was there but there again we were in, yeah. in like we, we were on crown land we're essentially i'm more of a crown land camper than i am a provincial park camper but the fact that we didn't even know that bear was there but never ever ever and I say this touching wood, right? Uh, that we've never, we've never 
had any encounters where our food has been in danger or our pets or ourselves and pets that that brings in a whole a whole new situation you know uh, the old dog bringing the bear back to your camp story right so you know these can happen these, these these encounters can happen everywhere but i find i find they seem to be more prevalent obviously in provincial parks where they have become climatized to people right yeah, yeah, um, and they yeah. can happen anywhere. I've, I've, like I said, I'm going through a whole list of them. Um, you can find the the uh, on Wikipedia if you Google bear attacks, you'll find a whole list of black bear and brown bear and, and polar bear attacks in North America. Um, the one that comes to mind that, that boggles me is a woman got killed by a bear walking her dog in a golf course in Arizona. Um, so. So I'm not saying it's exclusively a backcountry thing. I'm, it happens. It happens in front country, but it, um, based on what I've been reading and trying to pull together, there seems to be more predatory attacks in in backcountry areas. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Mark. I'm just going to drop you down into the green room, and we'll let Ben right. have his uh, his moment Mark. in the sun here. Thanks, Thank Mark. You, I appreciate you popping up. Uh, there we go. There's the right button. How are you doing tonight, Ben? I'm good. How are you? Good to see good, you again. Hey, good. Long time Chris no Julia. Nice to meet you, Kevin. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, yeah, I've only had two bear encounters in the backcountry. One was from a canoe, so and we were downwind, so it was just great. We could just watch it walk on the shore. The other was on a portage trail, and it was probably about 20 meters away. Uh, but it, in this in this encounter actually made me more confident and less worried is it did what I guess they're supposed to do. As soon as it heard me, it took off like a cannonball uh, through the forest. So I was kind of heartened by that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I was just wondering also, uh, Chris and Julia, after your encounter, which was pretty amazing to watch, have you been back out you may have mentioned this earlier because I missed the beginning of the show. And were you more nervous that uh, going out again the second after after that happened? Um, so th that's a really interesting question, Ben, because um, right after the experience, we were a little shaken by it, uh, and we were feeling a little more anxious than we thought we would. Uh, I think Julia handled it like a champ in the moment, oh, yeah. but being back, uh, it's it kind of lingered in the mind for a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, and that particular trip happened um, at the end of August. Um, and about a week later, we started to think about uh, going back actually. Uh, and the weather got really nice uh, that mid September. And we decided to go back. Uh, we, we, it'll be part two of the video series uh, with Cedar. No, but we, we went back, uh, we went back and had a fantastic experience. We went a little deeper in the park uh, on the water taxi uh, to an island and, and had a fantastic experience. Um, and then I think that was really healthy for us because if we had gone through the winter season uh, feeling the way we did, we probably, that, that feeling would have festered for a really long time. And so we were actually very, very happy that we went back. Uh, and then this summer, uh, we did the, the meanest link. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 And we've been back with Cedar again this summer as well. Yeah. We went back in the fall as well with Cedar. So effectively his third backcountry trip. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. I, I do have a question in general about hanging food. Um, I generally will try and find a tree to hang. Uh, sometimes it's in a barrel. Sometimes it's just in a bag. Um, and I understand you want to get away from your camp so that it's away from your camp. But I have come into situations, and one I'm thinking of in particular, um, where there is just no appropriate tree. In fact, yeah. I, I don't know if, if anybody, you know, I often use the, the tent style tents, ones that hang in the trees, the three points, to, and they're a lot of fun. But literally the only tree that I had any branch on was one of the trees that I was tied off to. <laughs> So I hung it because my thinking was, and I don't, this may be completely wrong, uh, but my thinking was, well, if something comes for it, at least I'm going to be able to hear it and get up and try and scare it away, or at least be aware of where it is rather than, I think it would freak me out more if I went to get my food the next morning and didn't know anything about it. And then, oh my gosh, something got into it. So 
I mean, I don't recommend necessarily hanging your food on the tree that you're right beside, but like, <laughs> what, what else, what yeah. else would you do? Yeah, there's a distance there in, in, in that classic diagram. And, and I, like I said, I, I don't follow that. Um, I don't, I, people should do whatever they feel comfortable with, but the distance I go for um, is, is not 60 meters or 200 feet. Um, I, I go for a safe distance that if there's a bear on the food, I can get out of the tent and think about what's going on, get my composure, get a weapon of some sort, an ax, the bear spray, a paddle, have something um, so that you've got enough space to make that happen. And every campsite is different and you just got to do your best. Cool. Uh, you showed the picture of the, the bear boxes in, in Pakasa and uh, I was up there was it last summer, not this last month, the previous summer uh, for a week. And um, the they, they were, yeah. The, yeah, it was the other ones. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it was so great to be able to use those, not to worry about hanging your food. But ironically, the last night, um, I had my food gotten into by mice that got into mm. those boxes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it wasn't bears I had to worry about. Mice. So I say it's not, it's not all. It's, yeah. Well, it's, it's usually the other animals that get your food. food. Right? Yep. Yep. I, got, I got an interesting question for everybody in the, uh, in the chat tonight. And, uh, here, here's another one of those. Put a number one in the, in the, uh, in the chat if if you are one of these people do you how many people out there sleep with like their knife by their side or an axe or some <laughs> sort of weapon uh just for fear of like you know a bear might come through your tent how many people I, i'd like to see a one i'm just curious about that because i've always i i used to always have my knife close by right and I don't anymore for, for whatever reason, you know, it's usually outside of my hammock. I'm a hammock sleeper as well. It's usually outside of my hammock underneath. Right. So it, it's not accessible for me, but uh, yeah, I've got a lot of ones in, <laughs> in the chat there. Everybody yeah. biting their nails out there. Right. Don't want that bear coming through. Yeah. So the, the one, the one thing now that always, always thinks uh, that I think is one of the biggest bear attractants is when you're cooking. Okay. You, you had a great catch. You've gone out there and you've caught a whole stringer full of walleye or pike or bass or trout. And all of a sudden you're back in the camp and you're starting to fry and you have, you know, you have your, your, your grease that you fried your fish in, uh, your batter. And that, that smell is like still on your hands because you've cleaned your fish. Uh, it, it's on your, it's on your night. That to me, that that's, I think one of the biggest attractants is all of a sudden, Hmm, bears like fish. <laughs> you know, what I, they like grease. Yeah. Right? So, like, what do you do in this case? How, how, do you, how do you try to safeguard yourself against the odors given off through cooking in camp? Anybody want to take that one? We, we I, I don't mind taking it. I feel like I'm talking a lot. No, no, no. Go no, ahead. No. You know a lot. <laughs> hey, Mern. Go ahead, Julia. Yeah, go ahead. Or Chris. Oh, I was just going to say, given what Kevin has told us about how good a bear can smell the difference between delicious fish cooking over the fire versus your food that's in your barrel. I don't know how big a difference or like if there's anything more, like there's nothing more that we do when we're cooking other than obviously good cleanup, but when we're actually in the, the thing is, it's like, everybody knows like, okay, if you fry, fry in your home, you have all that frying smell within your home. Right. And I'm asking this because I am generally one of the camp cooks when we go on our canoe trips, right? So I'm the guy that's standing over that uh, MSR stove with a little pot full of grease, deep frying my, my fish. And I know <laughs> I smell like fish. And I'm one of the only guys in the crew that cleans fish. I, I, I do too much when we yeah. go on these trips. But so I have, I have my, my, a fish smell on my okay. hands that is really hard to get rid of. So now I, I brought, I, I've taken to bringing a, um, like a, a narrow glove, right? Sort of like a, a latex glove type of thing. So I can peel that off, but then I have that garbage to worry about as well. Right. So, so you're the guy, you don't want to that smell in the tent with you. Yeah. I would say soap, um, you use good biodegradable soap and, and deal with it, you know, not in the water, but away on, on land. Uh, I would, you know, we're humans. We're going to cook a nice meal. Um, I know some people that when they travel, they, they don't bring bacon. They don't bring anything smelly to humans to cut down. So that's one step. Um, you know, that's not for everybody. We all got to make our choices. 
Um, another step is is just minimize all the scents. So minimize the the time your barrel is open. Minimize the time that you're cooking. You're going to put out a plume of odor for bears are going to smell for miles around. Make sure that's nice and tight and small, and then there's there's no more afterwards. Clean up right away. Don't don't leave your fist guts out um, for for a bear to identify. Like deal with them right away. Clean your fish. Deal with the guts. Better yet, clean your fish away from your campsite. Um, and and I, I dispose of fish guts in the water. I know um, a lot of direction is to to put them on rocks so the birds will get them right away. I like to put them in the water. There's there's scavengers in the water um, as well as on land that that helps cut down. So just do I try and do every little thing I can to cut down on it. But we all have our limits. Um, I've got a friend who doesn't bring bacon and he triple bags everything and he seals it in a barrel. I don't go to those those links. Um, we got you got to find your comfort zone and and uh, deal with it. Yeah, but even still, just putting those orders odors in the air now. Somebody just put on here, here we go, Connie put, when cooking fish at home, popcorn to get rid of the fish smell. Popcorn is getting to be a rage. Watch YouTube videos, and now everybody's getting into cooking popcorn out in the bush, right? <laughs> because it's an easy snack, and it's really good and everything. But popcorn gives off a very strong scent as well, right? And my, my concern is actually drawing the animal towards your campsite, right? Rather than, like, you know, all of a sudden this smells out there in the wind, and it's it's... And as you know, bears have these receptors and they're smelling this and all of a sudden they're going to start following their nose, right? And to me, that's my biggest worry is, is attracting an animal into camp that might not otherwise be there under yeah. any other circumstances. And, 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 and we get fooled, right? We get fooled by alternate scents and, and I, I've, you know, Febreze, um, <laughs> clean, clean scents for human, human noses. And I, I've been reading about... Uh, drug smugglers who try and hide narcotics they, they wrap it in plastic and then they they put that the drugs in a coffee container um because that fools uh sense uh, it fools humans it doesn't fool dogs and i don't think it's going to fool a bear mm -hmm. yeah well you know what you just try and keep them all away <laughs> whatever way you can right yeah. martin martin how are you doing tonight uh, very well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, I had a couple of uh, thoughts. Uh, first of all, Julia and Chris, thanks for sharing that video. That was um, harrowing to watch. <laughs> and you're to be commended for keeping your cool and for, for uploading that for everyone's edification. Uh, you might have taken some heat from uh, some people for that. I don't, I don't know if you did, but I could easily imagine some people uh, might have done that, but I think it was the a wise course. And Kevin, thanks for the videos you've been doing about bears. They're incredibly informative. Uh, the first video of yours I ever saw was uh, the one with the ursacs. And that's because I was in the market for an ursac and I was thinking of getting one. And one of the reasons I came on here uh, was I wanted to mention uh, uh, something about the ursacs that a lot of people don't know. And that is um, the, the company uh, ursac that, ma that makes these things, uh, they, they make, broadly speaking, two kinds. They've got many different models, but they've got two types. One is a bear proof one that the bears cannot shred, but it's not rodent proof. Small rodents can, can gnaw right through that thing. Then they've got one that's rodent proof, so it's a much tighter, finer weave, but it's not as strong, so bear teeth can shred that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so really the only solution if you want an ursac that will protect you against both rodents and bears is to buy both, nest one and the other, and hope that whichever critters attack it attack it in the right order. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, so, the other thing is the end. The yeah. end, if you pull it tight on the bear model, a mouse can get in there, no problem. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, get it to anything, those things. Uh, so I have, I have an ursac now, and I, I've taken to actually hanging it, uh, just because in all of the years that I've been uh, backcountry camping, and most of mine is on Crown land, is, and I'm not on uh, in provincial parks. Um, I've never had uh, uh, an issue with bears or even critters or rodents. I've had rodents sort of coming around my feet while I'm eating and cooking and stuff like that. Um, you know, mostly chipmunks and red squirrels and things like that. But I've never had anything get into my food. And I think it's because I, I, I hang my food. So even when I have an ursac, I, I try to hang it. Uh, and 
I'm just not terribly worried uh, about roads getting into it because it's it's hung up there. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind about ursacs is they're not waterproof. So if it rains, water's going to get into them. So you've got to make sure that you have your some uh, a bag within the ursac. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you can get one of the opsacs that that block out the odor. Uh, in my case, I just use an old you know roll top dry bag uh, that used to be my food bag. Years ago, I gave up on barrels. They're just too heavy to hoist up there. Uh, and I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to use waterproof, you know, those dry bags, put my food in that and hoist them up. They're much, much lighter. And that works. And then I can pack my food in my, my backpack because you can't get a barrel in there. Um, of course, it depends on how long you're going and um, you know how much food you have to bring. Sometimes a barrel makes a lot of sense. I've still got my barrels, but I haven't used them in years. Um, but I, I, I had a question for you, uh, Kevin. Uh, there's a book I'm, I'm sure you've read. You probably mentioned it in videos, and I'm just not aware of it. Uh, it's been mentioned in the chat by myself and others tonight. There's a, uh, a book uh, by Stephen Herrero, Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidance. Okay, I knew you would have read it. Uh, and I, I'm wondering what your impression of that is, because I have been recommending that book to people for years. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, you're on mute, Kevin. You're muted. <laughs> Yeah, my, my kids were chasing the cats in the hallway, so I, I put myself on mute. Uh, it's the standard. It's the um, it, it's getting a little out of date in terms of some of the modern advice and some of um, Dr. Herrero's research is criticized a little bit um, for the data set they use, not not for their analysis, but for the vintage of the data set. But the book talks about a lot of the behavior stuff. It talks about bear sense. It's a really good primer. Um, you know, the, the photos are, are black and white. It, it, it's not a modern book. I don't have to look at what year it was published, but um, it is it is sound um, information and, and a good foundation for anybody. I recommend it for anybody who wants to learn more about bears. And uh, before you start reading research papers, this is the one to go to, I would say. Okay, yeah, that, 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 that's my view as well. I, I would say one more thing about that book. Do not bring that book as you're reading on a camping trip. Uh, because it's just it's it's a, a fairly exhaustive survey uh, of bear attacks uh, that go back a long way, and uh, yeah. it describes what it's like to be mauled by a bear again and again and again, and it's pretty harrowing. Um, so it's 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 not for the faint of heart. It, it's hard reading in places, but it's incredibly informative. And I came away from it actually feeling better, even though I was terrified by the specific accounts of, of actual attacks and maulings and, and sometimes killings. Um, uh, but in the end, I came away thinking, OK, you know, the precautions that I take, keeping a clean camp and uh, cleaning my fish off site, you know, not on not in my campsite at all. Uh, and, you know, bear spray and bear bangers and, and, and things like that. Um, I'm still a little bear phobic. I, I if there's noise at night, I still sleep with one eye open and imagine that the chipmunk rustling around as a bear. Uh, uh, but I feel a lot better. It has never kept me from from going out. And so this is one of those cases where I think knowing about it uh, and knowing the reality of it is is better than having vague fears. You know, you you, you come away with sort of yeah. actionable information about what you can do. You know, you're mitigating the 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 risks uh, by having that information. Oh, my lights are flickering. Uh, uh, morning signs. Hey Ben, I'm just going to drop you into the basement of the green yeah. room. No problem. I got I to go do stuff anyway. So thank okay, you. Don't go away you. if you would like to uh, stick around for after the show. So. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Hey, Ben. Thanks. And I'm going to add to the stream uh, Donald Dakota. How you doing, Donald? Hey, Donald. I don't know if you can hear Donald. us or not. Can you hear us, Donald? Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Anyways, you guys finish off uh, or finish or continue with what you're going on. I'm having here. difficulties here. We can oh. hear you now. Oh, there we go. No sound. There you go. Can you hear us? Yeah, we I don't you. know if y'all can hear me here. I'm having we some real, now, real issues going on. So uh, I'm going to pop out of this here. So uh, okay, I'll try yeah. again later. Yep. Feel free to jump Thank back. Thank you a bunch, anyways. Okay. Um, I want to say, Martin, I think it's it's funny that you should mention not reading the book while you're in the backcountry. Uh, I happen to read uh, Adam Schultz's Alone Against the North. Oh, no. <laughs> I was reading the part about the bear while we were in a tent in the backcountry wow. in a lightning and thunderstorm. 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this book at nighttime uh, and it was the most terrifying time to read it. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually careful about what I choose to read in the backcountry. I don't, I'm not one, I, I like scary movies, but when I'm in the backcountry, the last thing I want to be reading about is, you know, someone who's been mobbed by a bear or some, <laughs> some horrific uh, misadventure while on a camping trip and stuff. I don't read any of those. You know, I tried to re read Hap Wilson's, um, uh, what was it called? It's not called Ring of Fire, uh, River of Fire. I tried reading that on a camping trip. And I found that unsettling, <laughs> so I had to put that aside. So my my wife and I watched a, uh, I think it was a either Prime Video or Netflix uh, original movie there a couple weeks ago, and it was a it's based on a true story on this couple who were out uh, hiking on a hiking trip, um, and it was in a park somewhere in Ontario, I believe, and. Uh, he ended up getting mauled and killed or like shredded by this bear. Right. And I'm, I'm wondering if that might be related to the story that you had mentioned earlier, uh, Kevin, where you, you thought it was a woman that was, was killed, but it might've been the guy. I wonder if that's the same based on the same principle or same story. That's uh, I wish I could remember the name of the movie. Yeah. Kevin. I don't have my other computer up. Yeah. 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 They're, they really are horrific. Uh, Martin was mentioning, you know, reading the book in the back country and, um, I, I've been reading some of the newer uh, things uh, since the 90s when, when bear spray was more prevalent because there's a lot of debate, is, is bear spray better than guns? A lot of my viewers are Americans and I get a, I get a tremendous amount of comments about guns. And um, for the most part, bear spray is proven to be more effective than guns. Some of Herrero's research uh, used data from the late 1800s, which you know people say, well, those, were, those guns weren't any good, so his paper's flawed. But... Um, I'm still compiling the information, but an awful lot of hunters uh, get killed. They have guns in their hands. Um, often they just made a kill and they're they're cleaning it and the bears alerted to it. Um, just horrific stories. And, and it wasn't until last year that someone who discharged bear spray was killed by a bear. So nothing, nothing is perfect. Um, they found his dead body. I believe he was in Alaska. I can't remember all these stories. I've, I've got them all in a spreadsheet with um, data associated with them. But th this guy was um, alone at his cabin in the back country. Um, and when they found his body, they found an empty can of bear spray. Um, so he only had one. So bring two. Um, but uh, they are horrific. And, and nothing nothing is 100% is going to save your life. Um, and we don't know the details. Did the bear come up behind him? Did he get a chance to dis discharge it properly? You know, you can just imagine the mess that that ensues. Um, but but by and large, bear spray has been very effective with that one uh, incident of, of of a fatality. And there's been a few other injuries, very severe injuries, um, but uh, no one's been killed except for that that one instance. Mm -hmm. uh Question that I've seen a couple people wondering here in the chat, Kevin. You might be able to shed some light. You may know, you may not. Um, can bears sense or are bears attracted to insulin? I don't know. Um, I would say that bears are very curious creatures. They're they're intelligent mammals, and so interesting scents could get an individual's attention. Um, I, I wouldn't know about insulin in particular. That might be a good one to do some research on. I, I have no idea. I've never had any experience with it either. Uh, if anybody in the <laughs> chat knows, uh, feel free to pipe in. Uh, that'd be great. We do have room for a couple of people. If you want to pop up on uh, on panel here to ask a quick question before the end of the show, I will post the link one last time here. Um, and I'll take up to two more people. And I will let you know if you made it or not. So if anybody is interested, there is the link. Uh Martin, have you ever had any experiences? Have you ever been confronted or had an encounter with a bear in the backcountry? I know uh, you're, you're you're a Crown Land camper as, as well as I am. So, yeah. So I, I'm I'm very very rarely uh, in a provincial park or anything like that. I haven't I haven't camped in a provincial park in over a decade. Um, and even before that, I didn't camp there a lot. I'm almost always on Crown Land. So I don't find myself in 
uh, campsites that tend to be filthy and frequently used by people who are sort of coming up for, from the city and not used to the leave no trace uh, ethic and practices and stuff like that. It's, it's mostly people who are fairly hardcore. And it's not to say that you don't, you know, come across a fly and fishing camp that's just <laughs> been trash. That happens too, but uh, not as much. So I yeah. don't find yeah. myself camping in established campsites as often. They're not as uh, heavily impacted and messed up. And very often I'm making a bush site in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, there's no bear that's habituated to people being there. So I don't have very many encounters. So I've never had what you'd call an encounter. Lots of bear sightings. Uh, one of the nicest ones was we were just sort of sitting. It was happy hour. Uh, we were having a you know, glass of wine under our tire uh, after a swim shortly before supper, enjoying uh, a, a sort of nice relaxing sit under the tarp. We're both reading and I'm sort of writing notes in a, in a booklet. And then all of a sudden I hear this clack sound. It sounded like someone had taken a cinder block and dropped it or something. And it was a bear across the lake flipping rocks over looking for grubs or something. And as soon as I heard the noise, I went, that's a bear. Nothing else makes that noise. That, that sound of a, of a flat rock being yeah. flipped over yeah. to another rock. I got up, got the binoculars, looked, and there was a bear. And, and it was the most beautiful thing. You know, it was, I don't know if it was a sub-adult male or a, or a female, but, you know, this bear was on the, uh, the, the, on the other side of this narrow lake that we were on. And clear as day, she was um, foraging for blueberries. <clears throat> and she was crawling on her belly. It, she looked like an otter. She was kind of crawling around and nibbling, and it just looked so beautiful and delicate. And she was sort of working her way along the shore. And I knew sooner or later she was going to come around to our side. <laughs> so we got in our canoe and we paddled to get closer to, you know, get some pictures and stuff like that. And as soon as she saw us, boom, she was gone. And that, I think, was probably the first uh, bear encounter we ever had. That's the closest I've seen one to our camp. So, no, I've never had any sort of bad experiences. I've, I've woken up and had the experience you had, uh, Dennis, of like, oh, look, you know, bear poop everywhere, you know, uh, or bear prints in camp and stuff like that. <clears throat> but nothing like an encounter, nothing like where there was a standoff or a challenge, or I've never been visited in my camp while we were there, either while we were asleep or while we were away paddling for a few hours and come back and you go, oh, a bear has been here. Yeah. But, uh, so nothing, nothing that would rise to the level of being called an encounter just sightings and, and and we saw five different bears on one canoe trip one time it was just they were out it was blueberry season they were they were feasting and it was it was great it was magical it was like seeing your first move so we were seeing our first bears we saw five of them on one trip so they've been uniformly positive i'm a little bear phobic so i always have my bear spray oh and i want to mention one thing about the the, the carabiner okay so i carry uh my bear spray in a holster uh, I don't want my belt to go through the holster. I like having it on a carabiner for a few reasons. One reason is uh, when it's when the carabiner is hanging off of my belt, it hangs lower and it swings better. So when I sit down, the the, the thing isn't the, the the canister isn't jamming against the seat or the gunwale or something like that. If I'm stern paddling, um, I can just sort of fold it forward onto my lap or behind me. It, yeah. it tucks out of the way when I need to sit down if it's on a carabiner. If I need to take it off and clip it to a pack or something like that, it's easy to do. Um, so it, it helps ensure that it's always with you. Um, uh, and uh, there was one more reason I was going to bring up the uh, the carabiner, but uh, it escapes me. Oh, yeah. When it's hanging lower off your belt, if you've got a canoe pack that's got a belt that goes around your, your waist, if you have some, a big bulky thing on your belt, it's going to be miserable. But if it's on a carabiner, it'll dangle below the, the the waist belt of your pack and it's much more comfortable so uh, by all means if you if you get bear spray that comes with a, a holster or if it doesn't take a holster or buy one and then use a carabiner you know it's, it's great and it's transferable you know like if if my wife's going to the thunderbox or something and it's far back uh in in, in the bush or our, we've made our privy far away or she's going to get the uh, the food bag not me i'll say here take the bear spray uh if i have to take off my belt and you know get it off my my, uh, my belt it's not going to happen, but if this way it's, it's easy, it's, it's transferable. So I recommend that practice to everybody. Cool. Awesome. We, we do have two more guests in the uh, basement. That I'll drop out. I'll drop uh, out. Stay, stay in the green room, uh, Martin, for uh, sure. after show and uh, okay. don't go away or you can pop back in after, just after the show. So thanks. All righty. So uh, we will get to, uh, let, let me find my buttons here. 
Doink, there's one. And uh, let's start with Troy for a quick question here. Troy, how are you doing tonight? I'm pretty good. How are you guys? Good, good. Thanks for joining in. Yeah, uh, not so much a question. I just uh, started watching. Hey, Kevin, just started watching your videos. I really like the uh, uh, content you got there with the uh, Ursac. I just started using one uh, there last year. Um, I do a lot of trips in Nelgonquin, and we always use the, uh, you know, of course, you can never seem to find a tree with, uh, you know, the perfect branch. So we always use the two rope or uh, the two tree rope, uh, very similar to what you have. I like where you can pull the rope up and then you pull your pulley up and then pull your, I never use a bear. Uh, I've always used the uh, seal bags, um, you know, like you use for kayaking and kind of thing. They work pretty good. Um, anyway, yeah, just comment and uh, your video, uh, Chris and Julia there, that was uh, pretty heroic. So uh, thanks for posting that. <laughs> thanks. But, uh, that was it. I just want to say a uh, great show, Dennis. And uh, Thanks, Troy. Pre yeah, Thank appreciate the uh, good info here you guys have. Nice to meet you, Troy. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. Yeah. <laughs> how, how many people out there are actually using a seal line bag for their uh, food storage? Is it uh, that's something that we used to use? Or, and it's something I'll use as a secondary. If our, our barrel is full, I'll, I'll put stuff in a, a big 25 liter uh, seal line. And, but it's usually things like breads, if we happen to bring like pitas and stuff like that, right? Or the overflow. That's all I've used for probably the last 25 years, the same one. I just started to get a hole in it. So that's why I got the Ursac bag. <laughs> yeah. You know, the only thing about these Ursac, well, not the only thing, but these things are bloody expensive. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I I managed to pick this one up uh, through, uh, it's a, it's like a, out, out in BC, it's a store like ME, uh, MEC, like MEC. Uh, it's called Valhalla. Anybody familiar with that? Yeah. They were like, I think, $15 cheaper than any other place I could find them, if I could find them locally. So, and it was, these things are like over 100 bucks Canadian. And then if you get the plastic bag with it, then yes. Yeah. Even yeah, more. yeah. There's like another $14 or something for, for, for two plastic bags. So, they're, they're not cheap by all means. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, it comes with the, the nice plastic bag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder what makes them uh, so scent proof as compared to a regular Ziploc bag or double Ziploc. Any, any, <laughs> any idea? I've, I've, say they're I've not tried really to research it. I, yeah, I've tried to research it, although. I've I've had very good luck with Ziploc bags in my little backyard test. The the bear ignored my Ziploc bag as well. Mm -hmm. That's not 100% conclusive because it's you know you need to repeat experiments and try different bears and, um, but they work. Um, I'm not sure that is it. Uh, maybe with my new uh, we got a new kitten and a new dog. Maybe I'll put some cat food in various bags and uh, see if uh, see which one is most <laughs> uh, odor proof. I'm glad you finished that sentence. <laughs> I had to put my cat in the dog in there and try them out, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the food in the bag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions, Troy? No, uh, no. Nope. Awesome. Good okay. show. Keep up the good work, guys. <laughs> Thanks very much. Appreciate you uh, popping up on Thank panel. Hope, yeah. uh, see you back in the show sometime. Yeah. See you out there. <laughs> awesome. And uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Kevin Callen. How you doing there, Kevin? Hey. Now, you know, I, I, I was hoping you would pop up because I know uh, you, you've had a lot of the great debate with uh, your good buddy, Cliff Jacobson, about oh, uh, yeah. hanging, don't hang. What's your take on all this? Uh, it's, it's what Kevin was saying. It all depends where you are. I mean, if you're, if you're in the far north, I mean, where, where Cliff goes, he's not going to hang his, his barrel like He's going to put it beside his tent with the pots on it. So when the bear comes out, he gets his, his shotgun in it, right? But when I'm just speaking in front of a whole bunch of people at the Toronto show that all go to Algonquin and Clarney, I'm not going to tell them that. Mm -hmm. Like, why would I do that? It's all and it's all to do with perspective, right? But I got to say, guys, like, oh, my God, bears are lovely creatures. Shut up, will you? <laughs> Jesus, you're terrifying everybody tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually working tonight. I'm I'm working on some some stuff, and I'm li li listening to the show. And I went, is someone actually going to say 
well, Julia did. She yelled, you're a beautiful creature, but go away, I'll kill you. <laughs> really, like, the, um, I drove the I drove the, the 401, which is a major highway uh, near Toronto yesterday, and I'm just terrified. That is terrifying. <laughs> it, so stop being worried about bears, for God's sakes. Really, uh, it's an Uncle Kev thing. Sorry, but stop. <laughs> stop. Yeah. No, you know what? There, there's nothing more that I like to see on a trip than a bear and a moose. Uh, one of my trips last year, we seen a, a bear swimming. It seems like every time I see a bear in nature, it's swimming across an arrows or, or something, right? Mizunabi swimming across a lake. Uh, you know, it's a yeah. I, I always seem to see them when they're swimming. I, I don't seem to see Kevin. them when they're just on shore until they get there and run out, right? But they they are they are awesome yeah. to see. Um, even one the one time we've seen one swimming, and I, I would probably never do this again. But this is years ago when I kind of didn't know better, where we paddled to catch up to the bear, right, and get some really cool pictures and watching this thing. And they're powerful swimmers. If you think you're on an island, people, this is just another warning. If you think you're on an island and you're not going to have a bear encounter, think again. Those things are probably, like, they, they are wicked swimmers, and they're fast, and they tread water, right? Yeah, Kevin Kellen actually has a story about a bear on an island. Yeah, that was that was scary. But I'm, I'm not supposed to scare people. <laughs> no, no, well, you know what? It, it's bringing awareness, right? <laughs> well, that, know, that, right? That's a good one, though, actually. It, it's all to do with um, uh, bitch bears like Kevin was talking about, right? I, and also, what, you, what Julia and Chris, what you dealt with was a bitch bear for sure. When I saw it chop its lips, too, um, I, I'm glad you didn't know what that meant. That's very aggressive. Uh, that's a very large boar. Uh, bear that actually is like, hey, I know what I'm doing. I've got food here before. You're not in control of me. And yeah, that 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 when I saw that, I was like, oh crap, that's not a good sign. But at the same time, it wasn't going towards you. It was going towards your food. So that's a really positive thing. It's mm -hmm. not going towards you. Predaceous bears. When Kevin was going on, I've dealt with three of them in my lifetime, and it's terrifying. Predaceous bears are very quiet. They're very secretive. You won't hear them coming into camp. And and basically they they deal with you with like a um a moose calf they'll knock your head off that's how they kill you they they take your head off and of, of all the the stories of, of people that have been killed one of my students actually was killed by um a, a male bear uh, on the Mississippi River and he was doing a soil sample for geology and basically yeah the bear came up <laughs> knocked his head off and his buddy hit the bear with a with an axe uh, the bear took off and yeah, they shot the bear later on, whatever, but, but so rare, like, again, I'm telling everybody to calm down, but I'm here. I go off and tell stories like, like that. But the one bear that I dealt with, um, we're, uh, in, in Tomogamy and we're on, uh, I forget the lake. It was in, it was a, a, an island in the middle of nowhere. So the bear had to swim a long way to get to our island, but I got up, uh, to have my morning constitution. Um, and in fact, I remember it was my, my daughter's birthday. Um, and uh, so I was getting a, the cake ready and stuff like that. And then I saw this bear swimming toward the island. I went, oh, crap. So I woke everybody up. And the family that was with us, they go, well, we've never seen a bear before. Can you just not scare it away yet? I was like, really? Um, so ended up that the, the bear was, uh, see, I terrified him so much he left. See? See? Look, that's, that's what happens. Kevin's so terrified, and he lives in Thunder Bay. Like he's a man; he's got a beard. <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Anyway, sorry. Go, go, go attention. So what was happening was that the bear was coming towards us, and I said, "Well, no, we need to scare this bear off really quickly because it, if we don't do it early, then the bear will be coming closer to the island. And the bear will say, well, 'Well, I'm going to swim to the island anyway.' Even so, sure enough, that's what happened." And I shot all the bear bangers over its head. Um, I shot flares over its head. Uh, I had the bear spray ready. And I did something that a First Nation person uh, taught me years ago. And I, I, I wouldn't say to, to try this, but it worked. Um, what he would do at his cabin when bears came into his cabin, he would get a rake, actually, and bang it on the ground like, a, like the, the antlers of, of a moose. And that's what, you know, a moose would say, hey, you're not dealing with, with me. And a bear would say, okay, okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. And that worked. So during that time, I did that with a paddle. So I banged the paddle on the ground like, a, like an antler of a moose. And, yeah, it worked. The bear swam off. And I broke the paddle. I was so aggressive with the paddle, I broke the paddle. The guy I was with, he actually made me that paddle. And he was so pissed that I broke his paddle. I said, hey, body on life, what the hell's wrong with you? But, uh, but it worked. I'm not saying that you should do that, but... But don't panic. I mean, 
think about the log like the whole logic of so why is that bear coming in to that island it's coming to get the food it's not a predaceous bear the predaceous bears i dealt with terrifying but um never think about what did did a book tell me to do? Like you, you would never think that at that moment. Yeah. When the bear, it's like, it's like being in an alleyway yeah. on a Saturday night, you either fight, flight or fright. Right. So, um, uh, I had a bear up by James Bay that was very, uh, predacious. It was stalking. And well, uh, Kevin, you know, Bill Ostrom. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know how big he is. Like yeah. that, that man is a giant. Yeah. Yeah. And that bear went for him. And we were scared because of the, <laughs> it, like, yeah. and, and basically we all got together as a group with Bill and uh, yelled it off and, and it s slowly wandered away. And then the next portage, it was waiting for us on the next portage. Yeah. Uh, at the end how of the many day, were you in the group? Uh, there was five of us. So, um, okay. and it, it was fine. It, it, it did say, okay, I'm done. Uh, we're, uh, and it didn't bother us at all. But of all the trips I've ever done, if I can only have three of those stories, anybody that's worried about, and I, I think it's a good question about insulin to be quite honest. I think actually the bear would be interested with insulin. Uh, any Anything to do with sweet smells whatsoever. But do not stop going in the back country because of this. Yeah. Okay? Do not do that. Go to the highway and look at the nightmare on the highway. That... Uh, I, I wrote a piece today for the Toronto Star, and they 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 were basically asking me the typical question. Well, geez, Kevin, you know, isn't it dangerous out there? If I had to list all the things that happened to me out there, ninety nine point nine percent were all human based. Uh, a, a pilot that didn't come pick us up for a couple of days, and we almost starved yeah. because because he was he was arrested for pornography scandal. Um, a local slashing our tires. Um, every like it had nothing to do with the wilderness. Nothing. It was all human based. Um, tragedy and, and error so yeah peace and love to bears <laughs> nope i got no problem with them i i have a question you you made a point about bears you made a yeah sorry, sorry I, we lost I, there, Kevin. i'm not sure what happened it probably was my fault but uh i i have a question for uh both of the kevins uh, I've heard of the, the predaceous bears essentially being really quiet and attempting to come up behind you and then do what they do with moose calves and take their heads out and essentially break the neck uh, with one fell swoop of their, their paw. Um, I think about that sometimes while sitting around the campfire at night <laughs> uh, because you're looking inwards towards the campfire and might not be aware of what's coming up behind you. Uh, does fire tend to scare bears away? Like, are bears concerned about the fire? Uh, and if they're not, what would you recommend doing to mitigate that that potential bear coming up behind you? <laughs> are you are you cooking s'mores at the time? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but but are bears uh, scared off by fire? Do like. Do the, do, do fires tend to keep bears away? Kevin, that, that's that's traditional wisdom. That's traditional wisdom for sure. I'm not 100. percent They're that afraid of fire. I think they're less brave when there's light. Gotcha. Um, so the the bear probed you during the day at, at dusk, and it didn't get serious about your food until dark. Um, Almost every case I know of, um, in a campsite situation, the one I had was like that, where the bear kind of, we, we saw it somewhere, we heard some noise down the lake. Um, so we knew there was something up, but the bear didn't um, approach us until it got dark. And then after the incident was over, we saw the bear at a distance in daylight, but it, it was not brave in the daylight at all. So I don't think it's going to approach a fire. Um, it'll wait till you're quiet. That's when they feel most competent. You know, they see very well in the dark. They smell very well. They, I think, they know somehow they have the advantage on you when it's very dark. Yeah, that, that's a really good point that I've been taught by the First Nations people uh, for many, many years. Is that if the bear comes into a camp during the day, that's not good. That means that bear doesn't give a damn about you, um, right. and it, it will take so much to to actually get that bear away from you, yeah. and it will come back. 
So again, like, like Julia and Chris, it will come back and it did, right? Um, where at night, it actually, and so again, we're going to the terrifying thing, uh, but uh, when the bear comes in at, at night, that means it's been stalking you during the day and watching you and waiting for the prime time to sneak in because it's afraid of you, right? So, or, or no, opportunist, it, it, it is yeah. being, being a, a, oh, I can't say it, Chris, a, a opportunist. A, 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 opportunistic. opportunistic. <laughs> Thank you. Say that three times, Julia. Opportunistic, opportunistic. opportunistic. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, I remember being on Lake Superior, uh, uh, Lake Superior, paddling Lake Superior solo, and a bear came in at noon, right at noon. And he came into my campsite and I took, I actually got a picture of that. And I was like, this is not good. And I got all my stuff together and I left. Cause I was like, if that bear is coming at noon, I'm going to be dealing with it the entire time I'm here. It's not going away. Right. Yeah. But it's really good that yeah. some parks, like for Nova Scotia, for example, and even Quetico, they started a new program the last few years where a bear becomes a problem. They get rid of the humans. Humans are not allowed to go into that interior area until that bear gets rid of its issue. And yeah. that's yeah. absolute true progression. I mean, uh, I remember guiding a trip in Quetico where uh, I had groups say, uh, there was a sign on the portage saying that we couldn't go any further because of a bear issue. They were furious at me. They're like, how dare you? We, we catch fish in this lake. We're going there. I don't care about the bear. The bear should be shot. I went, wait a minute. You want to go into the wilderness and 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 enjoy wilderness and enjoy wildlife, but you want to shoot the bear so you can catch fish. How anthropocentric is that? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. They were there first. Yeah. They were yeah there it's first, crazy. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, getting getting back to the daylight thing, all, all, all the folks I know who had a, sorry, all the folks I know who had a predatory attack, it was daylight. It was working hours. There were people working in the forest. They weren't out recreating. They weren't sleeping in a tent. Now, some have been. Uh, bears pulling people from tents in the dark that that does exist but um, all the ones I'm aware of where I know people who were in that situation like Kevin were during daylight hours um, so it's a it's a different bear yeah a, a predaceous bear really doesn't even know what a human is it just sort of looks at you like hey looks like I could eat you the uh, base island for example even though Let's it was try. a, a gonquin um, terrifying thing, but they had a roast uh, sitting there for days. It, the bear didn't touch it. It went there, and they they figured the bear was a male boar, um, uh, and it was not a, a garbage bear. It was basically wandering and base island too. That that one island, is the the lake is shaped like a teardrop. So that island is the shortest way to to cross that lake if you wanted to, and there's a whole bunch of. Um, uh, oak trees uh, for, for feed on. So it was just doing it sort of walking around and said, Oh, look, I could eat these people. And I don't know if you know, uh, but the whole yeah. uh, police um, report, uh, one of my past students, his uh, dad was one of the OPP officers that went, went to the Island and they, they were thinking of maybe darting it and not killing the bear. And then, yeah, it was doing the tear of the, the, yeah, it wasn't good. So, so, thanks for not scaring the shit out of me. Yeah, I know. Actually, I think the worst one in Algonquin is actually the one that was uh, on the uh, east side of a of a the, the 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 boys that went for the day trip for trout fishing. The one guy probably hung over or whatever, but he went to sleep in the car, and then his buddies didn't show up, so he went look for him, and the bear killed them all uh, except the one kid, and um, that's a predaceous bear, right? But again, you think about it, what? Uh, in Algonquin Park, that has like 40 years, two things have happened. Millions of people go to Algonquin Park every year. Two yeah. times that happened. Far a few between, yeah. 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 That's why I asked earlier. And, and you've had the likelihood of an encounter, right? It's, you've yeah. had, you've had, yeah. And you've had those experiences because you spend so much time in the bush. And that's, that's the point I make. The people I know who've had those encounters are people who spend every day of their life Monday to Friday, at least in the bush and they recreate in the bush. And so that's, you know, they're, they're the ones who are going to have those experiences, but Kevin started this by, you know, um, talking about the cool things about bears. There's, there's a lot of cool things about bears. We're talking about all the terrible things they do. Um, bears are fascinating. I, I've been learning more about them as I, as I read stuff and um, you know, bears put on weight like crazy yet. 
they don't get diabetes. A bear can gain hundreds of pounds in a year. So researchers think maybe we can find a cure to diabetes through bears. Um, they have very large home ranges, and at least in the far north. And so males and females don't necessarily bump into each other on a regular basis. So they have something called delayed implantation that they, they mate and the egg gets fertilized, but it doesn't implant in the uterus. It, it floats around until the bear is ready uh, to meet the annual cycle. So I, I found a couple of bears in my backyard making a lot of noise one night. And I thought that's a really weird time of year for them to be doing that. Um, and it was, I, I went to work and talked to some bios the next day and the biologist said, yeah, that's delayed implantation. That, that's that's what's happening. So they're, they're fascinating. They have so many fascinating features about them. Uh, we do dwell on the attacks and that's what this is about, but um, they're, they're amazing creatures. They, they're, they're fast, they climb, they jump, they swim, um, they see in the dark, they smell, they got the best nose in the animal kingdom. Um, they're amazing. Yeah, that, that is so cool about, about them doing that. I, I'm so glad you, you shared that. I, I, I tell my students that, they're like, what? Because <laughs> they don't hibernate. They're not a true hibernator, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. someone asked uh, 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 tonight if um, yeah. you've ever seen a bear during the winter. Yeah. Um, and in fact, at yeah, minus they, 20. They, they, go in, they go into torpor. It, it's not a hibernation like chipmunks do. Um, it's torpor. It's a different thing. Uh, they kind of sleep and they slow down their metabolism, but they're not an actual hibernator. Yeah. And tell them yeah. about how they hold their poop in, Kevin. Tell them. Huh. Nope. Go ahead. <laughs> they forget a bit about that. They do, though, don't they? They do. They do. <laughs> people say, does the, does the people have an expression, does a pope go in the woods? And I, you know, the pope does, but the bears don't. They they do it on the road. Oh, no, no. But in the wintertime, uh, when they, when they <laughs> put in into their deep sleep, they actually don't. Yeah. Move. They actually plug That's themselves right. in. They, Whereas a the ground, yeah, they don't, they, they don't so, urinate. Yeah, they don't. They make a mess. Yeah, yeah. Bears don't urinate and they don't uh, poop during the winter. See, Juliet, you didn't know this yeah. when you were actually yelling at that bear and spraying with nasty chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I say, and if you ever want, if, if anybody ever wants to see what a bear does when they come out of hibernation or whatever Kevin just called it, watch my second video for. Um, uh, the Smoke Lake trip, or the, yeah, Smoke Lake, the Bonacher. The campsite that I camped at, like I say, it looked like the bear had gone there and exploded. And <laughs> I, it, it was amazing. It was everywhere. And it, it wasn't typical little black pile of bear dung. It, it was, it was like, you'd have to see it. You'd have to see it to believe it, in all honesty. And it was everywhere. <laughs> so, took me a while to figure out. Somebody had told me it's called the bear unplugged, and that's what happened. So yeah, pretty shitty story, I know. But yeah, okay. Uh, if we are forty nearing, pounds of berries uh, in a day. I'd, I'd be like that. And I wanted to get this one question out of the way because it does pertain to a, a question that I've been having all night, and that is about bringing your dogs with you on a canoe trip. Uh, yeah. Kate Muskoka was asking, uh, dog. Okay, no, is that the one? Oh, the. Do dogs sense keep bear away or does it attract them or do you have any take on that? Okay, this is really important, but Kevin, you answer it. This is really important question to answer. It is, and, and there's there's no there's no perfect answer. Um, I've camped with dogs and was better off for it. I had a big, big husky one, uh, big husky dog uh, a few years ago. Um, he was very aggressive and very helpful with, with bears. But the problem is with, with most dogs is they'll chase a bear away and then the bear will stop running and turn around and fight the dog. And then the dog will run back to you. And so the bear will come back to you. So um, dogs can be really good. If you have lots of dogs, it's better. Um, I chased a bear in a campsite once in the East Provincial Park at five o'clock in the morning because we got up and I had the two huskies and I thought, okay, I'm going to give this, this bear some negative reinforcement. So I chased it through some campsites, but uh, on leash. Um, but yeah, it, it's a mixed, it's a real mixed thing. You don't want your little dog. Uh, barking is good. Barking keeps bear, bears away. We, um, 
we live in a rural area. We've had a dog out in our yard, a husky again. Um, so it doesn't come in in the winter. They're 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 an outdoor dog. Minus 30, they'll be laying out in the sun. Um, and, and that just keeps bears away. Um, that, that barking is really, really good. Um, but you don't want your dog chasing a bear because it'll it'll you turn on you and come right back to you. Yeah, that's how that, was that what you're looking for, Kev? Yeah, I know that's happened so much in the north. Uh, there's so many stories of that happening. I, it happened to me with my dog Bailey. I was starting a, a trip in Quebec and uh, a bear kept coming into camp because it was cooking this chocolate cake. And my dog went at it and um, and that bear wanted to eat the dog. That's why it was coming into camp. It wasn't a chocolate cake. And because it was a small dog, right? It wasn't like a husky or a wolfhound, whatever. And um, yeah, I, I, I just, everybody thinks, well, I'm going to bring my dog and I'll be safe. No, that you'll that little yappy little dog is actually luring the dog in or luring the bear in. So, well, once again, wasn't I supposed to yeah, just can, make, yeah, them, yeah. make them not terrified of going to the rules? You know, I, I'm, for, I'm fortunate. <laughs> uh, when we go on our canoe trips I, there. I spent like, a night on a small island in Quetico. You go ahead, Kevin. Sure. I, I spent a night on a small island in Quetico because I was doing a solar solo trip with a dog. And I, you know, I don't want to tie my dog up at night. So I look for a small island because that's ideal, right? You let the dog run around the island. Uh, a bear swam out in the middle of the night to the island. Not a big bear, not an aggressive bear. Um, I think just a curious yearling. Um, maybe looking for food, but but more curious. And it probed us all through the night. The dog barked. I eventually like had to tie up the dog and try and go to sleep while the dog was barking at the bear all night. Eventually the bear went away, but um, it was kind of a weird stalemate with a dog and a bear. And, um, you know, you, you got to know your dog. You got to know uh, what it's doing. There's also a, a bear on the Nipissing River. Uh, it was late night. We, we, we had to end the day. It was like 730. We got to camp and I went to use the outhouse and there was a bear terror Thing, tearing the third box apart and eating the human feces and plus a can of spam that was in there. So, <laughs> yeah. All the it, same. <laughs> they will eat anything. They'll, they'll, they'll drink gasoline. They'll, they love the, uh, a, a bug dope. Yeah. They love toothpaste. I had a bear tore, tore my entire pack apart on the Killarney uh, portage into, um, into Nelly Lake. And the only thing it wanted was my toothpaste. Right, so it didn't want anything to do with me. Yeah. Just one of yeah. my toothpaste. So anything smelly, deodorant. Don't wear deodorant. They don't like fifty sunblock, right? Yeah, yeah. Just don't wear deodorant. Stink as Wait. bad as you can. Maybe, maybe not as bad <laughs> as 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 Chris. You know, really, the good, oh my lord, I'm, my trip should just stink. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say about about the dog thing. Mm. Uh, we, my buddy and I, we've always had dogs on our trips, and. Uh, I, I look to I look to my dog and, and my buddy's dog as early warning systems. Um, they'll be aware of something approaching campsite long before we ever would be, right? Uh, if you see a dog standing yeah. on point uh, looking into the bush, you can rest assured that there's something out there, big or small, uh, something would be out there. So that that's when you can utilize a dog to be an early warning system out there, so. That's just my two cents on the dog thing. But I do agree with what Kevin said. I've heard that story many times where the dog will go after and then bring it back to camp. And you don't want that happening either. So you have to have control of your dogs at all times, right? You know, to, 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 to spin on the positive, though, that Quebec trip, actually, uh, the guys I was guiding with, uh, they took all the canoes and went down river, leaving me on my own with my dog with no canoe to deal with the bear. And I did. I mean, the bear eventually left. And I go, what was that? And they're like, yeah, you know, we're paying you. Like, you deal with it. But it, it, it's like that fear factor. It's like, so what your reaction was is to get all your all the canoes and leave me alone to deal with the bear. Like, like it, it's yeah, self-interest of society. We're all, we're all doomed. <laughs> I could never be a guide. I, all these stories that you tell and other, other guides tell, I just, I could have never done that. <laughs> I'd get so mad at people, I'd, I'd quit. <laughs> well, there's so many, there's so many good people though that you erase all the other yeah ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, well you know what, y'all, uh, we're at two hours and thirty five minutes almost into the show. I think we're gonna call it for the night. Um, everybody, stick around for the green room chat. Uh, don't go away. I uh, just want to thank Kevin. Thanks very much for uh, coming on, Chris and Julia, for spending your Tuesday evening with us. Uh, 
always great having you all on uh, on panel here for sure. Yeah. yeah. And if you're watching at home, uh, subscribe to Dennis, uh, hit that thumbs up, and also check out, I'm gonna point the right way, check out all of uh, Kevin Kevin's videos about the bears. Uh, there is a wealth of knowledge uh, on Kevin's channel and check out. channel as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, there, there there's a ton in there. I, I can't get this right. From both. Opposite, opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for everybody in the I chat, know, it's terrible. Sure some of the resources available down below in the uh, description, you'll find a link to uh, Julie and Chris's encounter with the bear uh, in Al Algonquin Park last year. Uh, you'll also find a link to the playlist for Kevin Outdoors and his, uh, his uh, playlist for all his bear information that he has put together. There's also some articles on, on their uh, links to articles. Uh, one that Kevin just posted on his uh, Facebook thing tonight. Uh, there's actually a couple of interesting tidbits on there. I put a link to that Kevin as well in the uh, description below. Kevin. So to Kevin Callen, that guy <laughs> down there. Yes, down there. Yes. That article you posted tonight. Next Facebook. time, just one Kevin. Yeah. Okay, wait a sec here. <laughs> Top shelf, Kevin. Bottom no, shelf, no. Kevin. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, anyways, uh, be sure to check those links out because there is a lot of information. Hopefully, uh, what we covered tonight there uh, sheds a little bit of light. But you know what? Ultimately, do not be afraid to go out into the back country. Just use your common sense and uh, your best knowledge. Do not give the bears an excuse to come into your camp. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But do not give them an excuse to come in. Do not be like the people before Chris and Julia do not leave trash in the, uh, in the fire pit. Do not leave garbage laying around, uh, the camp. You know what, if you pack it in, pack it out. Uh, if you did not pack it in and it's there, pack it out. Uh, that's always a good thing too. Sometimes we have to pick up after people and, uh, be more responsible than they, they ever were. So anyways, get out there, enjoy the back country. Do not be afraid of the wild animals. Cherish what you do see. Do not feed the animals, not even the squirrels and the chipmunks. I know they're cute as hell and you want to feed them and give them some peanuts and stuff. That is doing more harm than it is good for the animals. So they, what do they say? What's the saying? Uh, a fed bear is a dead bear, right? You ever heard that saying? A fed yeah. bear is a dead bear because a lot of times that they become too problematic, uh, they got to pop a cap in his ass, right? So that's my bad word for the day. <laughs> I knew that would make him laugh. <laughs> Anyways, just want to thank everybody for uh, joining in tonight. Uh, we'll see you next Tuesday night at eight or seven p.m. Eastern Standard. Uh, I think tonight's uh, live stream on Facebook as well was a success. Thanks to all that watched through Facebook. Feel free to get over to uh, YouTube. Uh, hit me a subscription and maybe a thumbs up on this video. And uh, that's about that for that. So anyways, people, keep the adventures alive, and we'll see you next time. Have and a great night. If you don't subscribe to Dennis' show, he'll put a cap in your ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, Kevin. We'll talk to you all later. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>